you, and we'll begin from my right and your left uh, with you, Mr. Weaver. Thank you very much, Councilmember McDuffie. You know how good that feels to say, Councilmember McDuffie. <laughs> um, in, in 2010, uh, you and I were two of the, the very few candidates that were in that election cycle uh, who talked about this issue. And we were running against two of the sort of most established ward bosses in the city. Um, and like anybody who goes through the door first, we got bloodied. We took it in the teeth. Many of the things that we were brought uh, in those campaign cycles were dismissed as not being real issues. Um, but any time that people that have sort of the reign of power uh, are threatened, I, I think that, that they will fight back. And what I think your election uh, in the special election has proven is that the city is changing. Ethics, um, how campaigns are, are funded uh, has become a, a serious issue and, and a real concern. I know that when we were running in 2010, um, we probably went through several times to see what the people we were running against were raising, particularly from, from uh, multiple aggregate LLCs. Um, and, and we talked to OCF, and the OCF last year, when the, the ethics bill came forward, they testified that any time that they would see um, a multiple LLC uh, contributions coming from a similar address, that it would raise a red flag with them. Well, if you look back to the 2012 cycle, uh, there are, Patrick Madden from WAMU has cited over 75 different incidents where LLCs have contributed to, to uh, re-election campaigns of current council members. In each of those incidents, you're talking 8, 9, 10, 12 times that a limited liability corporation or affiliates have contributed to an, an individual member. Uh, in many cases, there were, there were people who raised hundreds of thousands of dollars essentially from two or three different entities. This political process has to stop. It's been a game that we've played for too long here in the district, and unfortunately, there hasn't been a political will to stop. Um, the, the other side to this that I think does not get nearly as much um, traction is we've always had this system, and many people will always sort of say, as long as we know where these contributions are coming from, then that's okay. Transparency should trump this ability. Well, the problem that we've had is that there hasn't been a real layer of transparency. Uh, we now have moved away in, where corporations no longer have to uh, talk about who their organizational uh, directors were. LLCs are not required to, to do that. Uh, that's to, to be in comparison to partnerships, let's say, like of a law firm. Um, essentially, what we have now have created is a system where you can give multiple times through limited liability corporations, and it can't be, uh, it can't be tracked down. And the transparency issue is huge. We really, have to, uh, we really have to take that on full bore. Um, I, I remarked earlier that since 2010, this is my eighth time to testify about limited liability reigns. And so there have been several votes, most notably last year during the ethics bill, where Councilmember Wells offered up four amendments, uh, two asking for restrictions, two asking for sunlight. And I believe that all of them went down either 11 to 1 or uh, 10 to 2. Uh, this shows where, essentially where council members' bread is buttered, uh, and it's going to take a unique, and it's going to take someone who has seen it from both sides. And so I think that I'm, my appeal is going to be to you today um, to remember that candidate in 2010, the person who sat at each of the debates and forums and was dismissed by sort of the, the political class in, in the district. Um, People who, you, when you talk about passion, when you talk from, from uh, experience of what you were going through at that time, call back on that. And, and sort of, if we're going to have corporations be, be a part of the process here in, in the District of Columbia, there's nothing better than having like a hardware store or a restaurant that you get a check from to put up your sign in a, in a window. But the problem has become there's a group, small group of businesses that have been able, who have business with the city that are able to skew that system and really sort of tilt the, the wheel in an unfair advantage and, and, and obscure uh, true transparency. Um, I'll actually give up the rest of my time and, and turn in my submitted testimony a little bit later. Thank you, Mr. Weaver. Mr. Diner. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, members of the committee. Uh, I would uh, start by addressing uh, questions uh, one and two together, which is the uh, 
uh, restrictions that should be placed on LLCs uh, and the issue of uh, aggregate contributions. Is, is the light still on in your microphone, Mr. Darling? Oh, it's on now. <laughs> the um, uh, first of all, I would um, endorse the comments uh, that have just been made, uh, and that the law should be changed to prohibit the aggregation of contributions, where um, an individual can give and then can give again and again and again through LLCs uh, that. Uh, he or she owns and controls. I think that uh, it should uh, that restriction should not be just limited to LLCs, however, but to any corporate form form of, of entity. In other words, corporations, LLCs, LLPs. So, to the extent that uh, somebody would own a corporation, again, they would only be allowed to give once uh, and and not twice. And the reason for this is uh, rather obvious. This is a mechanism, uh, a loophole, that actually has the purpose of subverting the intent um, uh, and the reason for campaign finance um, uh, limitations, because it allows uh, a particular individual to uh, give numerous times. <coughs> Further, uh, for those who argue uh, transparency, uh, well, as long as there's a reporting, uh, what's the harm? <clears throat> and uh, I would answer that question twofold. One, uh, the harm is <clears throat> that it still subverts uh, the purpose. Um, <clears throat> it allows a particular individual to have undue influence over a campaign, uh, over the candidate of that campaign, and indeed over the electoral process. But secondly, it's not transparent. It's very easy uh, to have the LLCs uh, registered in ways where there's no way that you could tell with any certitude who is the person or persons uh, <coughs> behind it. Further, I believe the re restrictions should go to cover um, interlocking LLCs so as to not create a loophole where, uh, through the mechanism where you have the LLCs owned by other LLCs <clears throat> which, of course, all have one person uh, uh, at, at, at the bottom. Um, finally, and I see my time is coming to an end, uh, on the uh, uh, issue <clears throat> of the uh, money orders, I believe it's a simple issue. Money orders should be treated as cash. <clears throat> and uh, <clears throat> uh, the restrictions on cash, uh, $25.00 should apply to uh, money orders <clears throat> because money orders, uh, they're completely non-transparent uh, and it's a complete perversion of the limitation on, ca on, on a cash roll. We, we don't allow people to give thousands of dollars in cash. We shouldn't allow it with, with money orders. I've uh, <clears throat> uh, submitted my uh, testimony, which goes into these matters in a little more detail, and I want to thank you very much for the opportunity to testify today. And, and Mr. Donner, I don't know that you uh, actually stated your name for the record. So this is oh, okay. Uh, yes. Uh, 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 this is Donald Dynan, uh, who was testifying. <laughs> <laughs> my apologies for not asking you to do that at the outset. Uh, Ms. Brazil? Good morning. My name is Dorothy Brazil, and I'm the executive director of DC Watch. Um, I, I must state at the outset that I did not call, and nor did I intend to be on the witness list today. However, in reviewing the council's calendar for today, I saw my name listed, and certainly this is a topic I have a great deal of concern and background and history with. And so I came to um, to to hear the testimony of others as well as to um, express one or two concerns. As I've already indicated to you, um, Mr. Chairman, in a private conversation, uh, I am not supportive of the way in which um, this committee is going about reviewing um, the issue and reviewing the nine bills that are before it. To ask citizens to, in essence, in the month of March, come to four separate hearings one today, March 1, another on March 7th, another on March 21, and another on March 28th, to deal with the issue of campaign finance, especially in light of the fact that we went through two rounds of hearings last year. Um, let's say that that is not the approach I would have taken, nor would I recommend. What I would like to recommend to this committee is the following. Um, I think that it is fine and good uh, for council members and the public to support um, 
any tweaking, any refinement, any addition to our campaign finance laws. I think that the Office of Campaign Finance will agree with me that our basic campaign finance laws date from 1974, and anything that is that old needs to be reviewed and refined. I would have therefore preferred, especially in an initial hearing by this committee, in which uh, either public or in a more uh, private setting, in which you brought in people who have run campaigns, who have been treasurers, who have been watchdogs on campaign finance issues, and ask them, what is the problem? Why are we seeing these issues or scandals emerging, whether or not we're talking about the 2010 campaign or what have you? I frankly believe, and I think I have a bit of a track record on this, that as I said, while our laws can be improved and tweaked and what have you and refined, I think you need to roll up, the committee needs to roll up its sleeve and find out from people who have actually been candidates and treasurers and monitors of campaign finance, what are the actual problems in the administration? Because whatever happens, whether or not we remain with the current system or whether or not we um, make changes to that current system, if there is a problem in the administration and the enforcement of campaign finance laws. Whatever law we adopt, we'll still come back to the same problem. Um, again, I will make an effort to attend the additional three hearings. Um, I have had discussions um, off the record and in private with a number of people who I respect both on the national and the local level as regards campaign finance issues. And as I said, um, I know that the very last hearing you're having is sort of the catch-all in terms of uh, y'all come and y'all come and comment about any other issues. Um, but to, to break it down the way the committee has, I realize that these are um, uh, cumbersome issues, but uh, I would have preferred uh, starting out with an overview, especially since uh, you, Mr. Chairman, and your staff are new to this issue, and I think that there are a lot of us of us out there who would like to share with you our observations and experiences over the years. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Brazil. And uh, I guess I should begin by um, addressing the, the comment that you made, uh, and, I, and why I appreciate your efforts to come down and, and, and testify. What you do, quite frankly, as a matter of fact. Uh, I would say that it, it, it may be a bit of a mischaracterization to say that the committee has not, or to imply that the committee has not reached out to speak to folks who uh, work in this field, and that we have not spoke to treasurers and, and campaign uh, uh, workers who uh, have experience uh, in this process. Uh, we have and we continue to do so. And I think uh, structuring the hearings uh, this way uh, are uh, in the committee's uh, opinion, a way to break down what is otherwise a very uh, complex uh, issue. Uh, and while it, it may be redundant or, 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 or uh, something that's easily understandable or digestible to the folks who sit before me uh, who, who deal with this on a fairly routine basis, I think there are a lot of folks who, who perhaps are watching at home uh, and folks who engage in the political process uh, who, who could be impacted and affected by what we're doing and, and should also have an opportunity, uh, if they don't choose to testify, to at least better understand what it is the council is trying to get accomplished. And so, um, you know, uh, I think there are a lot of ways for folks who can't make it down to the Wilson Building uh, to submit written testimony and other ways for them to have their voices heard on the record or off the record. Uh, and, and we appreciate your efforts, uh, just as we appreciate everybody else who's contributed to this conversation. Uh, over the years and who will continue to contribute to this conversation so that uh, at the end of the day we can figure out how we uh, uh, draft and implement laws that go to the heart of what uh, I think a lot of people in this room feel uh, the, uh, the crux of the matter is, is increasing accountability and transparency as it relates to campaigns and in particular uh, campaign finance. And so uh, I appreciate your testimony and we'll keep in mind uh, some of the things that you raised, uh, Ms. Brazil. Uh, I do have a couple of questions, uh, and, and Ms. Brazil talked about this in her comments about the administration uh, of some of these laws. And Mr. Weaver and Mr. Donnie, you both mentioned uh, LLCs and the issue uh, that we face 
with the multiple contributions of individuals uh, who donate maximum contributions in their own personal individual capacity, but also do so uh, maximum contributions through their LLCs. The question I have, though, is, is th there's a bill uh, before this committee that would uh, have a complete ban on LLCs, and I want to start it there to see if that's something that you would be supportive of, or do you uh, think that there are any issues, constitutional or otherwise, that the committee should be mindful of as we, as we uh, think about how to address this issue? Well, thank you. I appreciate that question. Um, so I was the petitioner for Initiative 70, which was uh, seeking to have a citizen initiative that would ban all corporate contributions to uh, candidates for the D.C. Council. Um, and part of that was by design. And the reason that we did that was there seemed to be several members of the council who are looking for the exception to swallow the rule. Um, LLCs and, and most corporations in, in the district, just by the process of how they're organized and what they have to file with the DCRA, makes it impossible or nearly impossible to find out who it is that actually has the controlling interest of, of those entities. So, you know, and, and the Attorney General, uh, Irv Nathan, referred to, to our approach as a meat axe or a blunderbuss of, of trying to, to get it at what um, is obviously the problem, and, and I think that Ms. Bowser even had mentioned this, the true problem is people who are able to, to use the aggregates through LLCs. Um, for for us, we kind of viewed that the best way for for citizen initiative to do was to just draw a deep, uh, markation line, and we said um, 23 other states have banned corporate contributions to uh, to campaigns. Uh, as much as I liked having Mount Pleasant Hardware put up a sign for me, it was easier to say, "All right, they can't give because I know that the other hardware store down the street has three different LLCs attached to it, and we don't want to get into a uh, situation of." of sort of making a gray area. Uh, if the council was able to find a way to um, build more transparency into who are the controlling interests of a corporation or who are the controlling interests of a limited liability corporation, I think that, that it would be far easier for, for me to accept that, that um, a certain person wants to give through their small business rather than, than give an individual contribution. Um, but. As you know, as I said, I mean, if you if you look back to 2012, 75 different incidences where people had had, had an aggregate of LLCs that were seven, eight, nine, twelve times what they would be able to give as an individual. That obviously sort of harkens to the, to the problem. You can't have the ability to do that without having the, the transparency. And so, until we're able to get our head around the DCRA issue, I'm not sure if there's any other way to do it other than to, to sort of fully ban LLCs. Okay. Um, that's a good question. Um, it's a good question because it's 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 a very complicated uh, question. Um, I would start off by saying that I don't think that uh, if there is to be a ban, it should be just uh, limited to LLCs. I, I think that would be um, somewhat discriminatory towards corporate structure, and would be easily circumventable. That people would then just make them corporations. Um, so the issue really is should uh, one outlook um, <coughs> corporate um, donations, which would be um, co constitutional. The federal government does it. A number of states do it. That then, however, <coughs> brings to the troubling question of, well, are you going to allow union contributions, which the District of Columbia currently does? Um, <coughs> and um, the, the issue uh, of is it fair to ban corporate contributions but not ban union contributions? Um, contributions, or should you ban uh, both? Which then, of course, takes us into the murky waters of the Citizen United case, <coughs> where the corporations can set up <coughs> uh, independently directed PACs, etc. The LLCs could uh, uh, set that up. And while the DCRA uh, records are um, <coughs> um, not the most transparent, they're certainly more transparent than uh, these uh, these PACs that don't have to disclose anything to anybody, including who gave them the money. So it, uh, it gets to use the old cliche, we could be going from the frying pan um, into the fire. Uh, I think that um, the um, perhaps a, a fix uh, to add into the bill, uh, disclosure requirements uh, that are made uh, 
for corporations and LLCs at the DCRA, uh, where you would have to disclose uh, who the, <coughs> the true owner uh, uh, in interest is. I think, however, that to uh, ban giving by LLCs or to ban uh, corporate donations um, <coughs> uh, takes one on a, on, a, on a dangerous slope, uh, raises all the other issues, and could actually lead to a worse situation uh, than we have now. Uh, Mr. Mr. McDuffie, um, I just would like to add to what Mr. Weaver and Mr. Dynan has already said. Um, it had become fashionable last year, I think, in terms of the concern about um, clean campaigns and ethics to, um, to target LLCs. However, I believe that if you want to um, limit the influence, such influence, then if you go down that road, like Mr. Dynan says, then you must, in all earnestness, look at um, uh, contributions from unions, as well as contributions from the large nonprofit entities in the District of Columbia, which are down here lobbying like the big corporations, the Walmarts and what have you uh, in D.C. So, um, you know, it's, it's not an easy issue. Um, I, for example, am interested in any changes or revisions in the comprehensive uh, campaign finance bill that the Office of the Attorney General has drafted because I don't know how you word certain things so that uh, you don't create more of a problem because uh, I believe that campaign finance laws need to be simple, need, need to be easily understood, and therefore can be easily enforced. Um, but going down the road and saying th the boogeyman in the room is the LLCs, I don't buy it. Okay, and I, I think you all make some great points. Um, I think the, the, con the concern, uh, I think that you pointed out, Mr. Dynan, uh, specifically, is banning contributions from LLCs but allowing other corporate structures to, to donate uh, creates an issue. Um, I think also the question is raised about whether the, the issue is influence of, of money in can campaigns or is it the accountability and transparency that needs to be increased. Um, another important issue that you just raised, Ms. Brazil, is how complex we make this process. Uh, you said you believe that the campaign finance law should be simple, uh, and I think that the bill that's been introduced by the mayor is anything but. And I, and I'm, I don't say that to, to, to to minimize all the work that's been put into this, because I think it's very important work uh, concerning a very important concerning a very important issue. But we also got to remember, at the end of the day, we're not going to have in all these cases lawyers huddled up in the room trying to make decisions about these types of things. You're going to have lay people who want to participate in the political process, mm -hmm. and how we lay out and fashion laws and rules that will guide their behavior. At the end of the day, is I think what we're trying to achieve, and so uh, it's a very important point that you made, Ms. Brazil. And I want to ask—I know that you, you mentioned in your testimony, Mr. Dynan, um, some specifics about aggregation uh, of contributions and bundling, or the, the, the aggregation and the related party issue that's going to come up, and we're going to talk about when uh, the government witnesses approach. I think. Is, an, is a complex issue or area uh, within the bill uh, that the mayor's proposed. And I don't know if you have any particular thoughts about that, Ms. Brazil, but I'd be interested to hear, uh, if you do, about the issue of related parties and, and how that uh, is going to be uh, applied uh, practically uh, to people who, who, who are going to be donating the campaigns. Do any of you all have any particular concerns or any, uh, any well, I think comments? The issue of aggregating or bundling, whichever term you want to use, um, it's one that has been with us for a while. It goes back to the enforcement. I first became aware of the issue, um, I think, during the last campaign that Marion Barry had for mayor, in which you look down his campaign finance report and you see that you saw the maximum contribution from these different entities. Well, they all had the same address. And then you would go out to these addresses and you would see 20 plaques on the exterior wall with these different companies 
and then you would find out that they're really only one company. Um, I think it is an issue. I think it is an issue that needs to be addressed. I, I think that, um, again, um, the drafting of any, well, first of all, it's already against the law. It is against the law to, to do the, this bundling contribution. Um, the problem that has occurred is, is that um, the Office of Campaign Finance has no investigators. So it is incumbent upon citizens, whether or not Mr. Weaver or I, who regularly peruse these campaign finance reports, or Patrick Madden at WAMU, to say, wait a minute, you know, this address is recurring multiple times. Um, and so, uh, again, um, I want to stress that bundling is already against the law. Um, it is not being, the existing rules are not being enforced. Whatever we do in terms of tidying up that legislative language, I think it must be um, in plain English. And um, again, um, I had a case several years ago um, involving uh, Marion Barry's campaign in which the Office of Campaign Finance did um, investigate and did cite him for um, these multiple contributions from a single entity. But again, who is going to be responsible? Is it the campaign? who accepted the contributions from the uh, multiple sources, um, or is it the, um, the, the actual contributor? Um, so I think in the law, any revisions to the law it must be very clear as regards who's going to be responsible for any violation. And, and let me just make sure that the, the, the record is clear. You said that bundling is already against the law, and I want you to, if you could, discuss how you're referring to bundling in this instance. That you said is already against. I'm defining bundling as uh, a, a contribution from Mr. Dinan, who um, has an office, a law firm, and he might have five or six different entities uh, that he controls that use the same address, and all five of those entities then make a contribution. Okay. Okay. Ms. Weaver, I, I see yeah, no, I, I understand. I think we're in the that gray area of bundling yeah. aggregate. I, I understand exactly what, what Ms. Brissell is saying. Um, it is, this is a conflict. The, the Office of Campaign Finance last year came down and their director and their legal counsel were very clear that they felt that aggregate um, uses of different entities to, to you know, create what, what we refer to at the time as bundling, but we do it as aggregate, um, did violate what they viewed as, as campaign finance. But, but Ms. Brazil is 100% right that there is no investigative authority. The, the problem I have is when, when OCF comes down here and testifies and says that this is, this is a problematic, this raises a, a red flag and has given us several, in, uh, several incidents of where they say, oh, well, if it's using the same bank account or if the same treasurer is signing it or it's the same corporate officers, that, that's a findable offense. But yet we've never seen that since the time of Mary and Barry running for mayor. We, in, the, in the 2010 cycle, you can remember, um, there was a series of corporations that were backing uh, Mayor Gray and, and were backing former Mayor Fenty uh, that were backing, and, and uh, you would have the Washington Post or the Washington Business Journal write like a series of people that were affiliates of, of the same corporate entities that were giving multiple checks to, to people. That should have been a clear indication for OCF to be able to like do inquiries into that. And that wasn't even anything that you needed an investigator for. Um, that was something where they immediately should have looked at the Washington Business Journal and say, wow, there's $200,000 in, in different businesses that are, that are backing different candidates that appear to be the same address. Uh, that's, they didn't even need an investigator for that. The Washington Business Journal or WAMU or the Washington Post have done that, uh, done that legwork for them already. And it's frustrating as citizen activists to see that in the newspaper and then get nothing out of the government agency that, that's required to, to look into that. Um, as, as in terms of the other kind of bundling, you know, that's something that we've had a hard time even sort of looking at from, from a national level. I mean, at the federal level, you know, we're, we've, we don't allow direct corporate contributions to, to campaigns. Um, but, you know, there are often times when, like, a group of people from American Express or a group of people from Nike will back a certain candidate. And, and, They'll hold, a, they'll hold a fundraiser that it will be on their campus and ask people to contribute because that's in the best interest of their business. That's a tougher one to regulate, but at the end of the day, you at least know that, that when you know, Brian Weaver, 1812 Calvert, 
appears on a, on a, a finance form, there's an address, there's a person, that there's a connection to like where they work, and you can go and follow up on that person. What happens here in the district, though, is often corporations have, you don't know who's behind that corporation. The address is, could be a mailbox, et cetera, um, and there's no way to really track down who this person is. And in the case um, of last year when I came forward, I brought four incidents of, of a bundle, of a aggregate uh, contributions from, from a corporation that they didn't have a legal business license in the district anymore. They'd been revoked. So I mean, those are just like, the, that becomes a DCRA, OCF, and the council sort of thing, where if the DCRA's information is incomplete, or if they've had some sort of legal uh, um, restriction against them about doing business in the District of Columbia, it shouldn't, you know, at the end of the day, it shouldn't allow them to be able to give a contribution to a candidate for council or, or for mayor. Um, Miss, Mr. McDuffie, could I just add something to what Mr. Weaver said? Sure. We should not get into mixing up apples and oranges. Whether or not a corporation is in good standing at DCRA has nothing to do with their ability to make a contribution. It is an interesting factoid, yes. Um, but the question, I, I, I realize I'm not supposed to ask you a question, but in your opening remarks, you seem to make a distinction between your definition of bundling and aggregating contributions. Can you go through that one more time? Because what I was talking about might not fit your definition of bundling. Well, well what you were talking about is essentially what, what I d define as aggregation. The reason okay. that I tried to draw that distinction is because the, the term, uh, bundling is essentially a term of art. You get certain definitions depending on who you're talking to. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to, for the purpose of this hearing, and everybody listening to, to be able to distinguish uh, when we use the term aggregation, we're talking about um, you know people who LLCs, individuals who have multiple LLCs. But when you're talking about bundling, I was referencing the definition that's been proposed uh, in the mayor's bill, which I'll read just so it's, it's clear on the record. Uh, it states that a bundled contribution means any contribution that has been forwarded or arranged to be forwarded from one person, one or more persons, uh, other than oneself, to an elected public official, a candidate for elected office, a political party, or a political committee. So it's essentially uh, that. I wanted to just sort of draw that distinction so that it, it wouldn't be confusing to people at home who might be listening. I still don't understand what, what, the, what the definition is then. Because, say for example, everybody knows that when we get into campaign seasons, uh, there are um, fundraisers held at law firms. Right. And you go around and you collect these checks or they're put in a bowl or what have you. What is that? That's bundling, according to this proposed definition. When you talk about what we've been talking about earlier, <laughs> where you have an individual who has multiple LLCs and you've got all the plaques mm -hmm. on the wall, and it's one, really one person who's pulling the strings on all of these, and yet they donate $500 as an individual, and then they also donate a maximum contribution, let's say for ward-based rates of $500 to all these other entities. Right. When you aggregate all the donations in total, it's going to amount to more than the contribution for an individual. Mm -hmm. Any other regular voter or citizen might be able to contribute, and so that's an aggregate total. Okay. So, so that's the distinction I was trying to well, make. The definition that I have used in terms of aggregation or what I think is something that needs to be looked at is if you have an individual or a group of individuals who control multiple entities and in, and, and in a concerted effort to circumvent and the intent is important. Intent in the law is very important and intent is very important here. And in an effort to circumvent the existing limitations that would be put on that individual or that corporation, they then aggregate contributions in terms of the multiple entities that the individual or these partners might control will each give a maximum amount, okay? But they're all the same individuals. They, they, in many instances, they operate out of the same office. And, and that is, I think, what is abhorrent to people like Mr. Weaver and myself. Um, um, but. Are you going to go down that road and go after, you know, um, these meet and greets that are held in people's houses or at law firms in which people put checks in, in a bowl and, and say that that form of bundling is illegal? I mean, I think that, 
I haven't done the numbers, but I think a high percentage of campaigns raise their monies in this way, in terms of serious, substantial monies in excess of two hundred dollars. Sure, and in that in that form of bundling, the latter part of what you talked about, the, the folks who have uh, fundraisers and they and they put checks in the bowl. Uh, we're not going to discuss it as much here today, just because it's a separate issue related to contractor donations. Mm -hmm. um, but th th precisely what you mentioned uh, in the opening of this last comment uh, is what we're trying to uh, discuss in terms of the aggregations. And so it then becomes what I think you all have alluded to is, is an issue of enforcement. Uh, whether OCF currently has capacity to enforce, whether or not there needs to be more interagency coordination between DCRA, making sure there's accurate information there, but that at some way is is provided to OCF uh, who's responsible for you know ensuring that the information is accurate who's responsible for providing the information who's responsible for checking to make sure uh, uh, that uh, if somebody makes a contribution they list all the related parties and then who goes down the line and say this person is a related party but yet they're not a a, a owner or they don't have control uh, and so you don't necessarily have to count their donation against. I just think it it, it 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 creates and if you're sitting at home and you're wondering what I'm talking about, it's because this is a confusing issue. Uh, <laughs> yeah. and, and, and 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 it's something that we need to figure out how to put in plain language. Uh, ultimately what we whatever we decide it has to be in plain language so that so that your average uh, a donor I can figure this out. Mr. McDuffie, if I could make two su suggestions in terms of where you want to get sometime late in the spring in terms of writing the bill. I think that any changes to the law should be in simple English and be easily understood. There was a um, um, small meeting um, that Ms. Bowser, who was the previous chairman of this committee, had with the Attorney General just before the Council ended its uh, 19th session, in which they were looking at what fixes in the um, underlying bill that the Mayor had proposed that could be made um, to make it passable and palatable to the majority of the Council. And um, Mr. Um, uh, Nathan came to the meeting with one or two amendments. And I forget what the amendment did, and it was supposed to clarify something in the bill. I took that language to five different attorneys over the next week, and I said, just tell me what that means. Just tell me what that says. None of them, none of them understood it. We can't have that. And then we can't then go and play a gotcha game when someone violates that provision. So. I would, if I could make one recommendation is, is that any change in law need to be understandable, readable, and in plain English. Second of all, I think that in any changes in the law, you should step back and say, how will this be enforced, and who will enforce it? DCRA's got enough on its plate already, okay? And in the, this fiscal year, the Office of Campaign Finance was given additional resources and FTE positions by the previous chairman of this committee. She decided that what they needed to do was hire auditors. Again, she did not consult with the public or people who might have some knowledge of OCA. But in all this mix, and, I, and I'm, I'm thinking that they've gotten between five and ten new people. Not a single one of them is an investigator. So like I said at your performance hearing of the Board of Elections and the Office of Campaign Finance, right now the situation, and Mr. Weaver can attest to this, the whole system is predicated upon citizens mm -hmm. doing their homework, observing something that's wrong, filing a complaint. If you file a complaint before the Board of Elections, it not only has to be written, but it has to be notarized. Then you then subject yourself to a back and forth in terms of going to a hearing at the Office of Campaign Finance. Or in my in, in an instance, I had two weeks of hearings before the Board of Elections. That's a terrible burden to put on citizens. So again, I would say that any changes in campaign finance law, make it simple, make it in English, and make it enforceable. 
sw swap the, oh, sorry, go ahead. Right. Oh, um, Mr. Chair, I, I'd just like to add um, one comment on uh, some of the things that, that have come up, uh, and that is uh, uh, on the issue of uh, uh, aggregation, uh, that I think that uh, the legislation uh, should um, clearly uh, outlaw uh, aggregation along the lines uh, that, that we have discussed. Uh, and the reason I say that is because um, I am not sanguine that uh, the interpretation that aggregation uh, is illegal under current law uh, would survive court scrutiny. Whereas if it were in the law specifically, then there would be absolutely no question uh, and, uh, and, and, and no problem. And, and I, <clears throat> I wanted to emphasize uh, that point. Just quickly, one thing I wanted to say was like I do really appreciate the Attorney General's sort of effort in, in, in trying to write this law, but then again, I'm very wonkish about this issue. So like I, I felt like I I understood where he was going with and what he was trying to accomplish with it. But the last thing that that, um, that Ms. Brazil said, I, I just want to think about any other government agency that we, that we have here and, put, and and to think about like whether it was uh, DOH or it's ABRA, um, DCRA, if you made citizen activists have to be the, the police force for any of those entities, that you had no investigators that really went out and sort of did their own investigative work, or that auditors didn't lead to an investigation, that you were asking people who had saw violations of health to have to go and, and get a certified letter and a written complaint um, to, to push it forward to actually like have any action done. It, it, it would be chaos. And so uh, it, it is very frustrating to have the two entities that, that are essentially the cornerstones of democracy, and, and you're asking um, you're asking other campaigns essentially for the most part. I mean, for every Dorothy Brazil you have, you have nine other people that are running trying to either knock someone off a ballot or trying to hang them with with an OCF violation, um, as opposed to just people independently going out and seeing if there are these red flags that the OCF says the auditor is fine, but there's no mechanism to actually go out and enforce it. Where all carrot, no stick. Fair enough. I, I want to at least try to hear from you all. I know we talked a lot about aggregation in, in LLCs, but, uh, and I know you mentioned it in your testimony, Mr. Donnan, about money orders. Um, we, we know there's been some things reported in the media and there have been some issues around money orders. And uh, in your testimony, I believe you said, uh, Mr. Donnan, that money orders uh, is a simple issue. And I think I know where you're going with that, but I, I disagree a little bit because I think even if you were to um, make the limit on money orders the same as, as the limit on, on cash, um, do you mean maintaining that existing limit on cash, or do you mean if we were to increase the limits on cash, we should just keep the limit on money orders the same? Um, <clears throat> I was uh, not actually ad addressing um, now, whether the limit on cash should, should be increased uh, or not, um, it's currently $25, uh, the, um, uh, which I think is fine. Um, if you ask me abstractly, if, if it was increased to $50, you know, um, um, I'd probably say, no, I don't think so, um, but I wouldn't have a heart attack over it. But uh, the point that I was trying to make is that money orders uh, should be treated as cash, um, and the uh, and I see no reason to raise the limit on cash. Uh, uh, but by the way, and and the the reason uh, the reason for that is is because the uh, it's very very difficult um, or almost impossible, particularly if someone. Uh, is intent on avoiding the law or even evading the law to really track down the, the source uh, of money orders and to be handing out money orders and handing them around it's the same as handing out cash uh, and if you're going to um, limit cash you, you, you should uh, uh, l l limit the, uh, the money orders and I don't see any undue hardships um, uh, significant undue hardships uh, coming to anyone from that um, Ms. Mr. McDuffie, um, I don't have my uh, copy of the code with me today, but I believe there is an existing limitation of $25 on money orders. Now. There is. Mm -hmm. and, um, cash, and cash limitation. 
I can't remember if it also, I know there's a $25 limitation on cash, but I don't know if that provision also speaks to money orders. Um, no. uh, I, I, I would say this, again, uh, to put it on your plate. Uh, you'd be amazed at the number, the large number of individuals in the District of Columbia who do not have bank accounts, just, yeah. okay? Um, to deny them the ability to make a campaign contribution I think um, I think I don't think it's legal. Uh, I think it goes to their First Amendment rights. Well, let me let me ask you let me ask you there because obviously that that's one of the concerns that, that I was going to raise in my mm -hmm. follow up to, to Mr. Dinan. So I'm, 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 I'm pleased that you raised that issue, uh, Ms. Brazil, and something I know Councilmember Barry has raised uh, uh, frequently uh, in the context of this discussion. Uh, there are a number of people across the city who, who wish to participate in the political process who don't have uh, bank accounts. Um, we aren't exactly uh, excluding them from the process by limiting the amount of money, uh, but we do limit their participation in the process. Mm -hmm. And so I guess the question that I would have for you is how do you address that? How do you address the fact that how do you reconcile the issue of not being able to track cash donations, or in this case, the difficulty in tracking money order uh, donations with the, the important uh, right of individuals to participate in the political process. Obviously, there's a government interest in ensuring the integrity of, of campaigns and, and placing that uh, uh, against the interest of, of individuals to participate in the political process. How do you reach that happy medium? What, what do, you, do you have any suggestions okay. for that? Uh, um Two suggestions on that regard, and, and I hope they're both on target in terms of where you're going at. As opposed to what Mr. Dinan has said, it is not that difficult to track money orders. Money orders have a number on them. There is a code on them that will tell you where they were purchased. That, in large measure, is how the FBI and the U.S. Attorney's Office knows where and who purchased the money orders in the 2010. The code on those money orders told them where they were purchased, and as regards who purchased, they then went to the vendor and they got the videotapes. Okay. So again, it requires a little bit of legwork. And that's what I'm getting at, because okay. that, that was in the context of an investigation. And right, so right. What you were yeah. just saying that is that OCF would have to essentially investigate uh, to make that determination. I guess where I'm going is, is should there be a form that okay. that campaign should be required to provide okay. uh, that actually um, outlines the, the person behind the money order when they, when okay. they make that decision. That's the second part of my answer to your question. Okay. Right now, a campaign has to um, do its, its reports, and they're supposed to list the name of the entity making the contribution, the address, and business, or what have you. If you go through most of the campaign finance reports, you're lucky if you can read a name. Okay? The campaigns and the treasurers are not filling out and giving you the information so you can track that contribution. I think the onus needs to be on, 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 on a campaign. You cannot accept a contribution if you don't fill in each one of those boxes. The name of the entity, a traceable address, the business it's in, and if you wanted to add a box or something that says whether or not the business does, uh, has a contract with the city, I don't care. But right now, it is almost impossible. I mean, I think there are some campaigns that hand in campaign reports, and more than half of the information is not there, okay? Yeah. Do you find these, 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 uh, these, these violations or, or these issues more so with the electronic reports or the, the actual hard copies? That I, I imagine there's still some folks who are doing... It doesn't really, it doesn't really, doesn't, yeah, really I, doesn't make it, doesn't make a difference. Didn't, didn't, I th and I believe that like the last round of the ethics bill, we we did away with the old school old, hard old copy because I think that that was a way for some folks People to. to um, but but yeah, again, Ms. Um, Brazil was right. There was no a campaign doesn't. There's no penalty on a campaign to to turn in uh, reports that have half information, and that could just totally be that if you use one of the electronic ones, whether you use PayPal or. Um, uh, democracy Engine or, or Act, um, Act Blue, if you don't fill out, you, you need to make sure that, that every one of those, when they fill out, that everything has to be filled out completely. Now, the issue with, 
with money orders here in the district is obviously we're, we're looking specifically at one sort of straw donor filtering it out through, uh, or one specific donor filtering out through a series of straw donors. Um, we have to make sure that, like, that electronically we're not able to do that also. Because some campaigns have, have had it so that they've been able to manipulate in a very similar way uh, online information. And, and I just don't want us to, um, I want the penalty to be high enough that if you're saying that someone is a straw donor uh, using, using a money order, that we're, we're looking specifically at that because of one specific case. But I don't want it, on the other hand, somebody who uses an electronic form, PayPal for example, um, and we're not sure that that credit card or that bank card actually matches the name that is being submitted uh, to the campaign finance reports. And we have to be sort of clear that we're not creating a digital divide based on how the money is being taken in. Um, I, 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 you want to have that same sort of level. I mean, ultimately, it would be the same thing. Yes, you could go back and you could find out what bank card was being used, and yeah, that's a different name that they put in on the, on the reporting form. Um, but again, you know, if we can't get OCF to just to pay attention to multiple uh, LLC contributions coming from the same address, it would be hard to think that they're going to be able to, to go and check where money orders are coming from or where electronic uh, um, donations are coming from. In, in terms of uh, your, in, uh, further in, 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 uh, answer to your question is, um, I haven't looked at the campaign finance forms lately. But I, I, I seem to recall that when you list a contribution, you're supposed to list the name and the amount of the contribution and the address and what have you. But I don't believe you are required to say the form in which that contribution was made, whether or not it was no. a check, a credit card, a money order. I think that if you amended, I think if you, you do? You do. Okay. Yeah, there, there's a box on there that, that, that you're yeah. supposed to indicate the form in which it, uh, that, that, that it was. Okay. Made. And so those entities that, that, that reported money orders, um, I think that um, once you see, I, I think if my experience has been that um, if you have a campaign that's going to violate the law, it's not going to be uh, one or two instances. When you look at the entire report, there are things that will just jump out at you and what have you. And so um, I think in terms of the issue of money orders, when you see or look down uh, a, 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 campaign, a campaign's reports and you see just um, you know money order after money order and money order and incomplete, no addresses for um, people who are donors and what have you, that should be a red flag. That should go to the top of the pile in terms of the audit uh, branch of OCF or an investigative unit, if it were created OCF, just going in and investigating. And, and they're, yep. they're here today. We'll ask them about that. But I guess I'm still trying to figure out how we get to the issue of, of frustrating those attempts to to violate the law and circumvent donations, contribution limits by using money orders, but not penalizing the people who you mentioned, uh, Ms. Brazil, don't have bank accounts who perhaps want to donate, yep. uh, you know, 50 or 75 dollars via uh, money order. Uh, Mr. Chairman, if I could uh, address that issue, the. Um, um, and, and it is a, a, a counter, a, a counterweight uh, uh, type issue. How do you prevent the one without uh, hurting the other? Um, and it is true, I think the latest statistics, about 10% of the people in the District of Columbia d uh, do not have uh, uh, bank accounts. Uh, however, that um, if you go down and purchase, uh, to get a money order, you have to go down and purchase it. Um, in the same way, that person who doesn't have a bank account uh, can go into a bank and purchase uh, a bank check, either a cashier's check or, or uh, <coughs> um, a certified check. Uh, just um, the transaction is almost uh, uh, identical. I will, uh, and that would make the giver totally transparent. <coughs> they could give go buy a $500 check, $100, or $50, whatever they, they wanted to give. I will admit that in certain <coughs> uh, communities uh, in the city there would be a convenience and a loss of convenience factor uh, in that uh, the banks don't equally serve uh, uh, all the neighborhoods uh, in the city. And, and that, that would, uh, would be a problem. But then you get to what's uh, really what's happening in, in real life. If you look at the uh, and go through 
the campaign finance reports that are filed. And I'm sure our brethren here <coughs> from OCF probably even have statistics. Very, very seldomly are you seeing that money order box checked off. It <coughs> bona fide contributions are just not coming in in that kind of a large, uh, a, a large number. Um, <coughs> on the other hand, it seems like every other campaign, uh, there's a money order abuse <laughs> with the walking around money and the, the, the going ons and, uh, and, and the shenanigans. Um, and, and we can't, and it's not an enforcement issue, I and mean, we're not going to have an FBI investigation every time uh, you, uh, you, you, have, you have something like this. Uh, so you have a palpable wrong that should be stopped. <coughs> However, you don't want to hurt, <coughs> um, uh, particularly uh, our uh, less fortunate citizens uh, and or people that don't have bank accounts for whatever reason they have. But you're not closing them them off. Other than the, the convenience issue, w which I uh, mentioned, they're told the transaction issue is still the same. You're going in and you're buying a negotiable instrument. Um, <coughs> so you're not. Uh, closing these people off, uh, and if it comes to um, a a playoff between ending the wrong and maybe increasing the inconvenience to an extremely s small number of people in in real life, that, then these are the kind of choices uh, that, that one has to make. Um, and it's another issue why banks aren't in all our neighborhoods, but that's not in front of us today. Mm -hmm. I paid my WPFW uh, contribution yesterday having to do a bank. Uh, I went down to get a um, money order because, you know, I figured, like, if you're going to give it to PFW and it was the politics hour, you had to pay it in consecutive money orders for $51. So I was probably 10 deep in line from people ahead of me. And this is in Adams Morgan with, like, nine different banks right around there. Um, there are a whole series of people who, who do use money orders and that kind of transaction as sort of their, their, their form to do it. 50 cents or 25 cents for a money order as opposed, I don't know what a bank check would be these days, but uh, I think that's something that you guys are going to have to really think hard about um, in, in, in determining that because there are people that, that you know, that still stuff the, the, you know, their money in a coffee can and, and sort of live paycheck to paycheck. Do, do, do you, either of you have any specific thoughts on the, on the bills that are before the committee? The one would limit it to, to $25. Is another that would limit it to uh, money orders uh, to $100. And then there's the bill that I introduced that would have a tiered approach where uh, it would be based on the amount of the, uh, the, the, the contribution uh, in a particular race. Uh, do you, anybody have any particular thoughts on whether it should be $100 versus $25? I know, Mr. Donnie, you said that it should be uh, the same amount as cash contributions, which currently are twenty-five dollars, right. and you don't think that uh, cash contributions. Uh, I, it, well, I also said that if it were uh, raised, and even if it were raised to a hundred dollars, I mean, even keeping the cash twenty-five and raising the money or to a hundred dollars, I, I said that that wouldn't give me a great deal of anxiety, um, and 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 maybe that kind of compromise. Um, is the way to go. So, so but my answer is, is, is I wouldn't take umbrage at, you know, at, at that kind of, uh, because it, because there are conflicting values that you have to weigh, and, and and that could be a fair way of doing it. I mean, the true red flag is when there's two thousand, you know, when there's a series of two thousand dollar contributions that are coming through money orders, because the, you know, historically the folks that are using money orders aren't going to be giving. Two thousand um, dollars to to a campaign in an election cycle. So uh, yeah, if there's if there's a if there's a lower amount that you want to like raise cash and and make money orders parallel to that, I, I think I'd be fine with that. Um, contrary to what Mr. Dynan says, I I'm always um, erring on the side of enfranchising people so that if someone wants to make a campaign contribution that they can. Uh, I think the, the, the restriction to $25 is of another era. I would have no problems raising it to $100. Um, but um, in raising it to $100, I think that you need to have a situation wherein, just as I said earlier, um, candidates and treasurers are handing in these campaign finance reports. They're not complete. <coughs> They're not accurate, and in fact, they're not checking that box whether or not it's a money order or what have you. 
the Office of Campaign Finance now has a system where they're periodically, um, uh, presumably randomly selecting uh, campaigns to audit. I think they should come down real hard if they find out that um, a, a campaign <coughs> received um, money orders and, and failed to report them as money orders. Um, just as I hope they'll come down real hard when they um, can investigate and find out that campaigns receive cash money and did not um, uh, in, in violation of the <coughs> law and, and didn't, did not report it. So that's how I, I would come down. I, I think $25 is from another era and I would have no problems raising it to 100 Okay. Uh, I don't have any additional questions for this panel. I want to thank each of you uh, for providing testimony here this afternoon. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Our next uh, public witness is going to be Daniel Wedderburn. And I believe that is the only other public witness who has signed up to testify. If there's anybody else here today who wished to testify but hasn't signed up, then you can come forward. We are just uh, making sure that the green light is on in front of you, and then if you could just state your name for the record, and you can begin whenever you're ready. Committee. DC for Democracy is a leading non aligned progressive organization in the district with over 500 members. We have testified frequently before the Government Operations Committee on campaign and ethics reform. Back in October 2011, we presented 19 specific proposals, truly comprehensive in nature, to try to stem the loss of public confidence in elected officials. This was in response to the endemic pay-to-play culture, disregard for basic standards of conduct, and a distrust that public officials could police themselves. Most of DC for D's proposals were not adopted, and these included to ban those with or seeking contracts and grants with the district from contributing to candidates, banning contributions from lobbyists, banning the practice of bundling, and eliminating constituent service funds since 90% of these funds in 2010 were used for purposes other than to help constituents with emergency needs. We did succeed, however, in having an independent board created to strictly enforce ethics laws. Yet, the council granted it a staff of only eight. Consequently, this makes impossible vigorous enforcement of ethics laws. Now, my length, next lengthy paragraph I will not read because, uh, Mr. Chairman, you, you, you told us where you wanted the, uh, our comments limited today, which, which, which is, of course, fine, and, and, and we're following uh, to testify only on these matters. We will comment on other aspects of the bills when further hearings are held later this month. Accordingly, DC for Democracy proposes the following. And my first one is, is, it's not in here. I eliminated it by mistake when I was dealing with all this stuff about aggregate and bundling and, and what's what and so forth. That really uh, uh, was a perplexing issue for me. And, and I might say your, your wonderful staff person, Ms. Atkinson, was very helpful. But the first one is to ban contributions from LLCs. Now, we're not picking uh, uh, on LLCs because this goes along with our uh, very strong recommendation we've been making for at least two years that the, that the, that the uh, contributions from any corporation be, uh, be banned. Secondly, let's end the ability of persons to circumvent ac applicable contribution limits that others must abide by, such as through the use of multiple LLCs and other means. So we support the provision in Bill 20-3 that, that gets into this. And I'm not going to read that because it's, uh, 
over because there's been a lot of discussion about this. I think we, we understand we understand what, what what we're trying to do, and and we do need to. I, I will say that this that there are some uh, uh, answers that are not evident though in the in the in the bill uh, that was proposed, and 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 this gets to what Miss Brazil uh, in particular was saying about. The definition of aggregate, uh, it, it really needs to be, I believe, you know, it means one, two, three, four, like like that. Uh, yeah. I just want to make sure that Mr. Mc Chairman heard, heard what I was saying there. Okay. Uh, uh, and I, I, I've st still came in here today confused like, uh, the bill talks about entities, and uh, it, uh, there was no definition of what an entity meant. But um, so I didn't know if this covered only corporations or, or other businesses uh, and, and, and nonprofit uh, organizations, you know, like that. And, and I understand now that it does, but that that was not clear. And we certainly uh, think it should should in include others. There, an, another question that pops up to me was the uh, <coughs> the controlling party of of uh, 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 of a say an LLC or or, or any corporation uh, in terms of you know this aggregation of of contributions. Oh my gosh! I can't believe it. I, I, I didn't realize. Well, I, I have five minutes on uh, organization, right? Yeah, you actually have five minutes, but you can continue. Okay. Well, I, I won't belabor, but I think uh, try, trying to make my point about this, this need for, for clarity. Um, <clears throat> thirdly, D.C. Su for Democracy supports Bill 2003's proposal <laughs> to prohibit registered lobbyists from bundling contributions. We urge, however, though, that this proposal be strengthened to ban lobbyists and lobbyist employers from making contributions of any kind to public officials and candidates for elected office. Now, fourth, Bill 20-03 would require political campaigns to report the names, addresses, and employer of any person who provides two or more bundled contributions to the campaign in excess of $15,000, and the amount of the aggregate amount of these contributions shall, shall not exceed $15,000. DC for D supports this, but recommends strongly the amounts be reduced to at most $2,000 because of the, the pay to play implications. Uh, and finally, uh, four bills pr uh, propose dollar limits on money order contributions. Three would impose a $25 limit and one a $100. In light of the findings of abuse in the use of money orders, we believe significant lowering of the limit is necessary, and uh, $25 would be our preference. To close, powerful interests prefer the status quo, and many elected officials view reform as antithetical to their own interests. Real reform comes only sporadically in states and cities, and then in response to scandals that demand action. How this committee responds will have a major impact on regaining the public, public's confidence. Now, I just want to add, this is a personal uh, for me. Uh, I want to personally state that the recent change makeup of this committee <laughs> offers real, though cautious, optimism, the council may finally enact serious reform and thereby reduce the widespread despair amongst many of our residents about public officials. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony, Mr. Wedderburn. So if you could just uh, make sure you state your name for the record and that the green light is on in front of you. Thank you, Councilmember McDuffie. My name is Kay Schladuahedi and I came here uh, not prepared to give testimony. Um, I was simply here to uh, provide moral support uh, to my colleague Dan Wedderburn uh, and to listen to the proceedings. But um, after, after listening, I, I wanted to sort of make one point. Um, I heard uh, all but one of the previous witnesses agree that we need to uh, 
basically ban contributions from LLCs and corporations, and I, I think that is absolutely correct, and you have correctly brought up the, the difficulty of administration, which I think is, is as crucial an issue as the issue of eliminating corruption. And I think in order to do that, in order to make this law administrable, we really have to limit campaign contributions to flesh and blood individuals. As long as we allow contributions through any kind of artificial entity, whether it's LLCs, whether it's corporations, whether it's, it's uh, unions, whether it's any kind of association, I think we present a, a burden on the OCF and other government agencies and citizens that is really sort of impossible to surmount. So I think just strictly from the administration standpoint, if we go to simply flesh and blood individuals who are registered voters or who, you know, that limit it to that and I think we can significantly significantly reduce the burden on administration as well as reduce corruption in the District of Columbia. Thank you. Thank you both uh, for your testimony. I want to sort of start in the reverse order of your testimony, Mr. Wedderburner, with the, uh, the money orders. And you mentioned in your testimony that you think the $25 limit uh, for money orders, uh, which is uh, currently the limit for cash contributions, uh, would be suitable. Um, a couple of the things that we discussed on the previous panel and specifically raised by Ms. Brazil, and it's been raised by some of my colleagues, is that there are a, a number of individuals across the city who, who don't, for whatever reason, uh, have access to or don't utilize bank accounts, uh, who perhaps would like to participate in the political process through making contributions to campaigns. And whether or not limit them limiting their contributions to $25 would adversely impact their ability to engage in the process. Do you have any thoughts on that? Uh, yes, I do. Uh, and I had a sentence in there. I took it out uh, uh, after my first draft, you know, thinking of time. Um, I, I would say this. I think we need to make sure I would answer it this way. We need to make sure that anybody who, 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 who's registered, well, or no, who's a DC resident who wants to make contribution, that should not be precluded from doing so because of an arbitrary amount, say like twenty-five dollars. So, uh, it would, I think, be helpful to, if somebody could look at the uh, the range of these money order contributions. And I'm not talking about these $2,000 things, but it's at the lower levels. Now, if we find that quite a few uh, exceed $25, uh, I, I think there's good reason to, uh, to, 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 uh, to up that limit. Um, yeah. Thank you. Do, you. do you want to comment on that at all? Um. You don't have to. I was just... Sure. Um, I do think that, as other people have said, that it is something that needs to be balanced. There is that issue, but there is a problem with money, cash being fungible. And so I do think that when you're talking about significantly larger limits, that there is a record in the city of various, you know, money being thrown around. And so I do think that I'm also willing to increase the limit, perhaps, but I think if we increase it too much, we really open ourselves to some serious corruption problems. Okay. We, we also talked about the issue of uh, individuals donating uh, uh, in, in their personal capacity and then donating through uh, LLCs that they own. And I thought it was it was fairly telling in your testimony, you mentioned that it was, for you, it was sort of a complex issue to grasp uh, as it relates to aggregating contributions and uh, even dealing with the word, phrase, entity and figuring out what, what was included in that. 
And so my question, Mr. Waterburn, is do you think that what's included in the mayor's bill as it relates to aggregating contributions, the way it's currently written would be helpful? Or do you think that it might make a system of contributing to campaigns more complex? And so making it burdensome to individuals uh, who otherwise wouldn't circumvent the law? Thank you for the question. Um, I don't think it would be a burden, and I can say that. Uh, I've been treasurer now, Mr. Uh, or, or the OCF people, uh, they know. I've been treasurer of, of, of campaigns and or for organizations for the last 15 years in a row, including incumbent council members. And I must say, everyone I've, this is, uh, everybody I've been treasurer for has won. They've been incumbents and they've won re-election. <laughs> um, Got a great track record. So far, yeah. So uh, uh, I, I think the mayor's, Proposal is as is, is good as far as it goes, but 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 again, I get back to uh, the, the you know a clarity as to what who's going to be affected by this, and and one of my I'm glad Miss Ladawahedi brought this up. A concern I've always had, and I don't think it's dealt with in 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 the mayor's bill. Uh, pretty sure it's not. Uh, is to get try to go back and get to the the real source of the contribution, and uh, that would be an ideal situation. Uh, so uh, that's where I come out on. Okay. Uh, you know, Mr. Dinan, I believe it was mentioned in his testimony that he definitely thinks that this bill and the law should uh, get at the root of the problems of, of uh, as it relates to aggregating contributions to avoid individuals who wish to circumvent the maximum contribution limits through multiple LLCs or what have you, uh, parents of subsidiary uh, corporations. But he also stated that he doesn't believe uh, we should aggregate the contributions of family members. Uh, do you all have any thoughts on that? Do you, would you agree with that statement that? Well, that's, uh, I'd like to say I, I do. I, that, that's a tough one uh, on, on family members and, and who, to, to how many we're talking about, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, of who, who is a family member or not. Um, uh, I, uh, I, I don't know that I have an answer to that, or, or may, maybe I, I, I might have missed the, f or forgot the first part so, of your question. So he talked about the multiple LLCs and, and that we should we should not allow you know, uh, corporate directors who have uh, control of a corporation to uh, aggregate beyond their you know, individual donations. Right, right. Uh, and that we shouldn't be able to use multiple LLCs to, to, to uh, go beyond what a contribution limit is for an individual. Uh, but he also said we should not extend uh, uh, this, this issue of aggregation to uh, directors of corporations who don't have uh, control uh, or to family members of, of directors who might have control. Yeah. And so I wondered if you all had any thoughts on that. Well, this is to the director, uh, and again, this is part of my not knowing what the scope of this is. is uh, for example, uh, you know, we talk about, it talks about the controlling uh, officer or director. Uh, it, it sounds to me like uh, they're only talking about one person in that company, not all the officers and and all the uh, the uh, uh, directors. And I, I would uh, it'd be nice to have have the, the, they included in that, but I, I don't know. I don't think they are. Uh, can you answer me that question? Well, that's one of the questions we're going to pose to yeah. uh, the attorney general when he, he comes to testify, just to provide some clarity uh, as it relates to um, the issue of aggregation and related parties. Right. Uh, so, so we'll ask that. And, and, and there's there's think. also and and I. Uh, I Man, man, uh, some years ago, I was uh, a, a member of finance committee for a uh, person running for for the mayor, the mayor's job, and uh, uh, I, I went to uh, one major company in the city, and uh, uh, 
uh, I received, well, when I was there, I was the, the president of the company while I was there, he, uh, he went up and down the hallway uh, on the floor where all his top people were and, and poked his head into the, each office and said, hey, uh, you know, I want you to make contribution, such and such, you know, max, actually maximum contribution. So I left there with uh, about 19 checks. And, um, uh, uh, you know, and this gets at the question of is, is that a proper thing? And we, we have, in our elections today and, and yesterday, whereby that, that happens. I mean, a corporation uh, may give $2,000, but then it goes and, and gets all its uh, people or, or people who can afford it. And, and they either make them or ask them for contributions. So that so that company, and I'm, I won't state it, uh, uh, you, you know, then they give all this money to one particular candidate, and this happens frequently. No, and, that, and that's an, an issue, um, and I won't bother to even re read the definition of related party, but we're going to ask a lot of questions uh, of our government witnesses to, to address um, um, how, who, first of all, who is included in that? Uh, that speaks to your question as to whether or not it's, it's simply a director or a board member who has uh, control uh, over the entity. And there's a definition of what, what control means in, in, the, in the bill. Uh, or in the scenario you just described, uh, where a person who perhaps does have control uh, over an entity or some sort of influence uh, might poke his head into the offices of several employees and say, I want you to make this, this donation. Uh, those employees perhaps uh, aren't contemplated uh, in this definition of, of related parties. Or if they are, uh, we're going to ask government witnesses as well how practical it's going to be to, to actually enforce uh, a law like that. Uh, and so, you know, we've been talking about enforcement uh, a lot this morning. Uh, we haven't even gotten to the government witnesses, but, but I imagine that's going to be a huge issue uh, for the Office of uh, Campaign Finance uh, as we contemplate how we uh, tackle some of the root issues that we have uh, as it relates to campaign finance uh, without putting uh, overly burdening uh, these agencies or the individuals who, who have to uh, follow the law. Can I make a quick comment to what you just said sure. about the enforcement? And, and enforcement, I mean, you can pass a law and there's little or no enforcement. I mean, it, it, it quickly becomes known and, and, and it's useless. Uh, the, uh, and, and that's been, I, I alluded earlier to the, this new independent election uh, ethics board was given a staff of eight. And, and when you look at the scope of what they have to do, and that includes enforcing all uh, conflicts of interest, you know, alleged and so forth, for the entire, not just the uh, legislature, but the entire ex executive agencies. That's, that's simply impossible. And, and, and also the Office of Campaign Finance, which I've come to deal with for the last 15 consecutive years in a row, they have a very competent and overworked staff. And uh, they just, and thank God they are being given this increase of eight, eight or nine more employees, but uh, <laughs> and they've often been criticized for not doing their job. But it's because of uh, of, of t t an inadequate force to do so. Uh, well, I, I appreciate you you both uh, coming down to testify this afternoon. Uh, if there's anything else you want to add for the record, uh, if I haven't already asked you, you can feel free to do so at this point. If not. Uh, then, then uh, I don't have any additional questions. So, so again, I appreciate you coming down to testify. Thank you. you. Thank you. have any uh, additional public witnesses at this time and so we're going to call the gov government witnesses up. What I'd like to be able to do is to have uh, Mr. Nathan, Mr. Sobin, 
And I believe uh, Mr. Sanford has testified on behalf of the Office of Campaign Finance. If you all could all come up and if you could, please. Do you swear or affirm under penalty of perjury that the testimony you're about to give to the Committee on Government Operations is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yeah, I do. Uh, I'll let you all decide who wants to go first. I'll go first. All right. Good afternoon, Chairperson uh, McDuffie and staff. I'm Irv Nathan, Attorney General for the District of Columbia, and on behalf of the Executive Branch of the District, I'm pleased to testify before the Committee today regarding the Mayor's proposed legislation to preserve and protect the integrity of our election process. Amid criminal convictions and allegations of misconduct that have damaged public confidence in the District's electoral system, this administration has made clear, and made clear last year and continues to make clear, that campaign finance reform should be a high priority for the district's government. Towards that goal, the mayor in the spring of 2012 tasked my office with recommending a series of campaign finance reforms based on a careful assessment of current law, best practices in states and major cities that have recently revised their campaign finance laws and the informed perspective of individuals and groups with expertise in this area. I should say, in response to a comment I heard in the public uh, session, that we interviewed a number of people, people who have run campaigns, people who have been candidates for campaigns, people who have studied the District of Columbia campaigns, and the recommendations that we made to the mayor reflect those comments, and of course the mayor, having uh, run campaigns, having served uh, on the council, having chaired the council, was uh, well informed with respect to these issues. Our recommendations, as adopted by the mayor, aim to balance two important principles. On the one hand, candidates needs, need to raise enough funds to get their messages out and to fully inform the electorate. And on the other hand, the electorate must be assured that the process is fair, open, and free of even the appearance of corruption. As directed by the mayor, I outlined his proposals in testimony before this committee in June of last year. We released draft legislation for public comment in August 2012, and after giving careful consideration to comments we received, we submitted a revised draft bill to the Council in September. Unfortunately, despite a hearing, this committee did not mark up or vote on the bill in 2012. Reflecting the priority that the Mayor places on this legislation, he again submitted this proposed legislation to the Council at the very beginning of this session in January. Chairman McDuffie, we commend you as the new chair and we commend the committee for moving forward on this issue early this year. The Mayor's Bill, so-called Comprehensive Campaign Finance Reform Amendment Act of 2012, contains a systematic, carefully balanced series of reforms based on pre best practices of other jurisdictions and on a thorough assessment of the perceived vulnerabilities in the district's current campaign finance law. We urge the committee to approve it uh, and to improve it, if that's possible, and to send it to the full council for a vote. In today's hearing, you asked uh, the focus to be on the questions of, one, what appropriate restrictions should be placed on campaign contributions from limited liability companies and their owners and officers? What reforms are necessary to address the related issue of aggregated contributions which are sometimes confusingly referred to as bundling, and what, if any, restrictions should be placed on money order contributions. We agree that those are important issues, and the Mayor's proposed legislation addresses those directly and in the context of comprehensive reform. They are part of his effort to provide legislation that will prohibit the evasion of campaign contribution limits. Effective limits are obviously meaningless if one can contribute through an unlimited number of LLCs, or use multiple money orders to evade the $25 per person limit on cash contributions. As I say, the Mayor's Bill addresses these concerns along with other related weaknesses in current law that we submit should be considered as a unified package to deal with a whole series of related problems. Accordingly today, I will briefly address the core proposals in the Mayor's Bill, 
emphasizing those, provi uh, those provisions that address this committee's stated areas of focus for today's hearing. And in the process, I'll discuss both other aspects of the mayor's bill and the other bills that are before the committee today. The other bills reflect commendable focus by the members of the council on these issues, but they're either piecemeal approaches or would not be necessary if the council adopted the mayor's comprehensive bill. I look forward to the committee's discussion and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. First, let me turn to the aggregated contributions. Contribution limits combat corruption by preventing any one person or company from wielding or appearing to wield undue influence over elected officials and candidates. Unfortunately, loopholes in the current law let some individuals and companies dodge those limits. The mayor's bill addresses this problem by preventing multiple contributions through various controlled entities, by barring registered lobbyists from bundling contributions, and enhancing disclosure and strengthening enforcement. The mayor's bill prevents individuals and companies from using inactive corporations, corporate subsidiaries, affiliates, or limited liability companies to evade statutory limits on contributions and expenditures. And I must say, I, I disagree with the previous statements by the public witnesses that that is illegal now. It is not illegal for a series of um, limited liability corporations or companies to make um, up to the maximum contribution. They're all uh, separate, and so that's not uh, prohibited now. Our bill would prohibit that, and I explain why. Any individual or company that makes political contributions under our bill would be required to identify any entities they control and any entities that are controlling them. So, for example, if a corporation wants to contribute to a candidate's campaign, it would have to disclose to the campaign its officers, directors, and most importantly, its controlling shareholders, as well as any subsidiary or parent companies. The candidate's campaign, in turn, must disclose that information to the Office of Campaign Finance. This gives the public more information about where uh, political contributions are coming from, and it's also important because under our bill, any contributions made by those who control a corporation or by the subsidiaries of a corporation would be treated as contributions by that corporation itself and vice versa. For example, an individual exercises control over the financial affairs of the corporation. If he contributes the maximum amount to a candidate's campaign, then the corporations that he control would not be allowed to make any additional contributions to the campaign. And this prevents people and companies from using LLCs or any other kind of corporate entity to evade contribution limits. As I've testified before, we believe this is a more targeted, more balanced approach than simply banning corporate contributions, as one of the other bills, 2025, would do. Now, we, we note that uh, the bill uh, 2037 uh, by Mr. Grasso and uh, Mr. Wells incorporates the mayor's related party definition, but uses the attribution provision that uh, was in our 2012 version of this legislation. Upon further study and after receiving comments from the ACLU and others, the administration in the 2013 legislation narrowed this provision to more narrowly tailor the ban to emphasize the concept of control and thus further strengthen it against any First Amendment vulnerability. That in essence says that it's only those who control the LLC whose contributions would be aggregated with uh, that entity so that the limits are maintained. The attribution provision in the mayor's bill would be enforceable because a corporate contribution would have to be accompanied by a statement by the corporation reflecting its controlling parties. And any false statements made in those forms would be punishable by a felony prosecution. Both the campaign and the Office of Campaign Finance would be able to use computer technology to cross-reference the names of controlling shareholders and thus to enforce the maximum limits and eliminate evasions through corporate forms. Now, with respect to bundling, and bundling by bundling we mean bringing uh, checks in the amount to the campaign, uh, we say that um, bundling ought to be um, uh, dealt with as well. And one of the types of evasions is when a lobbyist gathers contributions from multiple sources 
and presents those contributions in one lump sum to a candidate or a political party. That's what we call bundling. By taking credit for a large group of contributions, lobbyists can create the appearance, whether it's deserved or not, of having influence with undue access to office holders and to avoid even the appearance of inappropriate influence or access, the mayor's bill bars registered lobbyists from forwarding or arranging to forward contributions from other people to elected public officials and candidates or political parties. The bill ensures that when anyone who's not a lobbyist bundles significant amounts of money for a campaign, the public is fully informed and each committee affiliated with a candidate must disclose the names of any contributors who have bundled more than $15,000 for a campaign. With respect to money orders, currently, as you know, cash contributions and money orders are subject to two different rules. While a person can contribute only up to $25 in cash to a candidate, he or she can make money order contributions all the way up to, and possibly beyond if there are evasions, the total contribution limit. We don't think that's a sensible system. Most methods of payment, like checks, can be traced with relative ease, so a person who wants to write a check to their favorite candidate should be able to do so up to the maximum amount. Cash and money orders, on the other hand, are more difficult to track. Allowing people to give hundreds or even thousands of dollars in money orders significantly impairs efforts to inform the public about where each candidate's money is coming from. For that reason, the mayor's bill, like Bill 2025, changes the current limit by limiting money order contributions to $25, the same limit that applies to cash contributions. So we, we disagree with proposals that would allow money order contributions to be higher than cash contributions. But if the amount of the cash contribution were increased, say, to $100, we would have no problem having the money order have the same limit. So whatever the limit is on cash contributions, we would have the same limits with respect to money order contributions. Now, prohibiting people from exploiting loopholes in the law to evade contribution limits is an important step, but it's not enough. When the source and amounts of contributions are made public promptly, it's easier for the Office of Campaign Finance to identify those who are attempting to evade contribution limits and easier for the public to be informed about the sources of each candidate's funding. It's a key step in restoring and maintaining public confidence in the process. The mayor's bill enhances existing disclosure requirements in a number of important ways. It requires electronic filing and disclosure, which promotes transparency, accountability, and timely release of important information. All contributions in the last 30 days before an election would have to be disclosed to the Office of Campaign Finance within 24 hours and made viewable on the office's website shortly thereafter. Further, when anyone runs an ad supporting or opposing a candidate or an initiative or a referendum, the ad would have to include a statement disclosing its sponsor. The mayor's bill also refines existing disclosure rules by tailoring disclosure to the type of filer, which promotes disclosure while still adhering to First Amendment principles. Under current law, committees that do not coordinate their activities with a candidate's campaign are treated just like those that do. Under the mayor's bill, committees that coordinate with a candidate would face all the disclosure requirements they currently do, along with some additional ones. But our bill would require those committees to identify any persons or corporations that exercise control over them, along with subsidiaries, officers, or directors of each uh, corporate contributor. But committees that do not co uh, coordinate with a candidate's campaign would face less rigorous requirements. They would still need to disclose the names and addresses of their officers, along with sources and amounts of contributions and, and, and the expenditures that they make. The mayor's disclosure reforms also promote accountability by giving candidates a degree of responsibility for what their committees do. If a candidate files documents with the director of campaign finance, the candidate would have to swear or affirm under penalty of perjury that he or she has used all reasonable diligence to ensure that the candidate and his committees or her committees are in compliance with the law and that his or her political committees have made their contributors aware of the rules. We believe that requiring candidates to make such a statement under oath will meaningful, meaningfully incentivize compliance and promote a culture of accountability. 
We also think enforcement is extremely important. Prohibiting people from evading corporate contributions or contribution limits and making sure the public knows where each candidate's funds are coming from are vital to effective campaign finance reform. The rules will only deter people if would-be violators believe they will be caught and punished when they violate the law. For that reason, the Mayor's Bill strengthens enforcement mechanisms in two important ways. First, it enhances the current civil and criminal penalties for violating the law, giving people a stronger disincentive not to do so. Second, it gives the Office of the Attorney General authority to prosecute certain violations as misdemeanor offenses, providing for the first time ever some local government criminal enforcement of this important set of local laws to complement the U.S. Attorney's well-recognized enforcement authority for the more serious and felony offenses. When would-be offenders know they could face prosecution by either our office or the U.S. Attorney, they are less likely to ignore uh, the rules. We also, in the bill, help people comply with the rules by providing incentives to rely on advisory opinions that they seek and receive from the Office of Campaign Finance. Now, while the committee has decided to focus on a subset of the issues today, I want to emphasize that the mayor's legislation is comprehensive in scope and also addresses pay-to-play restrictions, which I understand will be discussed at a future hearing. I want you to know that the national experts at Public Citizen who contributed to our um, drafting of this uh, bill and our ideas here, have said that if this council has the wisdom and courage to adopt the mayor's proposed bill, the pay-to-play rules will be among the strongest in the nation. And we urge the council to move promptly forward on all the components of the mayor's bill. W one matter that none of the legislation addresses, but the committee should promptly address, is the appropriate campaign contribution limit for the elected Attorney General. As you know, the first primary elections for the District Attorney General position will take place in April 2014, with the general election in November 2014 and the elected Attorney General assuming office in January 2015. As it stands, the District's campaign contribution law does not address the campaign limits, the contribution limits, for this newly elective office. We recommend the committee cap the contribution at $1,500, the same as for the chair of the council, another citywide office with less responsibility than the mayor. This policy choice would be consistent with the choice made by the council and the voters in 2010 to set the rate of compensation for the elected attorney general equal to that of the uh, chair. So in conclusion, I would say that the reforms in the mayor's proposed bill can dramatically improve the district's electoral system by increasing transparency and combating both actual and perceived corruption. We look forward to a continued dialogue with this committee over the next month or so and to working with the council to enact bold, comprehensive, and systematic reforms to the district's campaign finance law. Thank you. I'm pleased to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Nathan. Good afternoon, uh, Mr. Chairman and distinguished members of the committee and members of your staff. Um, I am William Sun. For attending this hearing with me today are Renee Coleman, uh, Audit Manager, and Dwayne Gilliam, Supervisory Auditor for the Office of Campaign Finance. Thank you for this opportunity to testify on the contemplated restrictions on campaign contributions from limited liability companies and their owners, aggregated contributions, and proposed restrictions on money or their contributions to political campaigns. It is our understanding that there are currently three versions of proposed legislation that are designed to restrict the amounts in which campaign contributions may be made by money orders, specifically Bill Number 20-0025, the Campaign Finance Reform Amendment Act of 2013, would limit the amount one may contribute to a political committee by money order to $25. Secondly, Bill Number 20-0043, the Money Order Contribution Limit Amendment Act of 2013 would limit the maximum contribution by money order to $100 per contribution. 
And finally, bill number 20-0028, the Morning Water Tiered Contribution Limit Amendment Act of 2013 would limit the maximum contribution by money order to 5% of the maximum contribution for each office. For example, the maximum contribution for the office of mayor would be $100, for chairman $75, at large member of the council, $50, and member of the council from award, $25. While the Office of Campaign Finance cannot indicate a preference for any particular piece of proposed legislation, it does appear that in view of the fact that all contributions of $50 or more must be itemized on reports of receipts and expenditures, a maximum money or the contribution amount of at least $50 would provide some of the additional transparency that the Council is seeking to assure. Despite the fact that contributions by money order have been the subject of a number of recent media reports, the Office of Com Campaign Finance has not encountered an extraordinary amount of activity involving money orders during the last 10 years. Even though there has been an increase in the use of money orders during the past six years, the increase has not been significant. Specifically, during the 10-year period beginning January 2002 through March 2012, contributions by money order represented less than 1% of the over $36 million in total contrib contribution camp to campaign committees, approximating $267,000. As part of our research on this subject, we conducted a review of contribution limits in several states and discovered the limitations on contributions by money order vary. For example, the states of California and Connecticut do not specify limits on contributions by money orders. The state of Maryland requires contributions in excess of $100 to be made by check or credit card. The state of Massachusetts prohibits contributions by money orders. New Jersey limits aggregate co currency contributions to $200 in an election year. The state of Virginia does not impose any contribution limits. And the state of Washington requires contributions in excess of $80 by written instrument. And finally, the Federal Election Commission does not impose contribution limits on money orders. However, contribution by cash Contributions by cash cannot exceed $100. Notwithstanding the foregoing, it has been our experience that contributions by money orders tend to pose a potential problem based upon the difficulty in verifying whether the individual whose name appears was the actual purchaser. As I am certain members of the Council are aware, most establishments, including the U.S. Postal Services branch, that branches that sell money orders do not require or request identification to purchase money orders in amounts of less than $1,000. Thus, it is relatively easy for one to attribute the purchase of a money order for a contribution to a campaign by merely appending the name of a third party to the instrument in violation of campaign finance law, which prohibits making a contribution in the name of another person. Further, this creates a mischaracterization of a transaction that becomes extremely difficult to trace. However, the Office of Campaign Finance is prepared to assist this committee in any way possible with its efforts to eliminate any existing or potential impediment to greater transparency regarding campaign finance transactions. With regard to imposing restrictions on contributions from limited liability companies, as you may be aware, in July of 2011, the district's business code was amended to effectively accord LLCs the status of corporations. According to DC campaign finance law, a corporation is considered a person with the ability to make a contribution to political campaigns that are separate and distinct from its incorporators. Similarly, a limited liability company may make contributions to political campaigns in the District of Columbia, which may be attributed to the company apart from its organizers, as long as the LLCs are organized as independent entities, despite the fact that they may share a common address. Therefore, perhaps an important first step 
may be to provide a definition of entity in the DC official code that encompasses ownership of multiple limited liability companies for attributions of campaign contributions. Finally, with regard to aggregated or bundled contributions, it might be advisable for the, conf for the council to require recipient committees to segregate aggregate contributions from individual contributions by itemization on a separate schedule. Additionally, a, co a continuous reporting requirement could be created that does not expire until the recipient committee is granted permission to terminate by the Office of Campaign Finance. This requirement would produce a reviewable record of aggregated contributions on all reports of receipts and expenditures filed by the recipient committee. This concludes my testimony. I we'll would be happy to entertain any questions you may have. Thank you, Mr. Sanford. Mr. Silva. Good morning, Chairperson McDuffie. And members of the committee, I'm Darren Sobin, the Director of Government Ethics for the Board of Ethics and Government Accountability, or BIGA, as we are quickly becoming known. Uh, I'm pleased to be here today to offer the Board's input with regard to legislation currently under consideration by the committee. Um, I preface my comments today, though, with the understanding that though we support these proposals generally, none originated with BIGA, nor will BIGA be tasked with enforcement should the legislation be enacted. With that in mind, I will limit my comments accordingly. Uh, I see that there currently are five different bills under consideration. Rather than focusing on any one particular legislative proposal, I'd like to highlight some of the common themes that are significant to the board. Overall, the legislation clearly is designed to strengthen campaign, campaign finance laws in an effort to minimize opportunities for persons dealing with the district government to influence inappropriately those in a position to provide them with business or other benefits. In addition, the legislation promotes greater transparency through increased requirements regarding disclosures. The board supports these efforts as they are designed to promote positive ethical principles and open government. I'm going to move past my comments that I have written about the pay to play because I see that it will be the subject of the March 21st hearing. Uh, and I'll move to my other comments. The board supports those provisions that address bundling by lobbyists and limits on contributions by corporations, keeping in mind, of course, the constitutional restrictions uh, in that area. With respect to lobbyists, we agree that one area of concern is when lobbyists bundle campaign contributions by gathering contributions from many sources and then forward them for donation. And so doing lobbyists create the appearance that they have the ability to garner support for the candidates for whom the donations have been gathered and have the ability to influence those candidates, a power broker, if you will. We support proposed legislation that would prohibit bundling by lobbyists and those acting on behalf of a lobbyist, treating them as individual donors subject to appropriate contribution limits. With respect to corporations, we support legislation that would require corporate donors to disclose subsidiary and parent companies, as well as officers, directors, and controlling shareholders. This transparency is important to good ethical government. In addition, we believe that any final legislation should include provisions that make clear that the contribution limits applicable to an entity include contributions made by those who control, are controlled by, or in common control with that entity. This will limit the appearance that the entity can garner support for a candidate and influence that candidate. With respect to money orders, we agree that, like cash, money orders are difficult to track and should be more tightly regulated and restricted. The board, however, does not have a position currently on a specific monetary limit for money orders, except that they should probably be treated in the same manner as cash. Although there are other provisions to these bills, I would like to emphasize the efforts at transparency, especially any proposal that would require increased disclosure in political action committee reports and an oath or affirmation by the person filing the report. Certainly, filers should be required to use all reasonable diligence in preparing a report and then to affirm the accuracy of the contents. Finally, we believe that electronic submission of reports will make public disclosure easier and provide for a more efficient release of information. Indeed, BIGA itself is in the process of creating a searchable electronic filing system for the various filings and reports that we receive and oversee 
including those from lobbyists and filers of financial disclosure statements. Even though jurisdiction over enforcement of the provisions of this legislation will remain with the Office of Campaign Finance, the Board supports these efforts to promote good ethical government and increase transparency in the area of campaign finance reform. This is an important issue for BIGA, not only because of its government ethics responsibilities, but because of its open government oversight through the Office of Open Government. Beyond that, I don't have any specific comments to make or changes to propose on the substance of these important campaign finance reform proposals. I'm pleased to answer any questions the committee may have. Thank you. I want to thank uh, each of you for your testimony here this afternoon. And I want to begin <clears throat> my questioning uh, uh, as it relates to the aggregated contributions. With the uh, new disclosure requirements proposed by the mayor. The legislation takes an important step toward increasing transparency in elections by requiring donors to identify related prop, prop parties. And I'd like, if I could, to, to ask you, Mr. Nathan, to explain, uh, just for the record, and you probably mentioned this in your, in your testimony, but uh, the problem uh, that you are trying to address by requiring the identification of related parties. Yeah. I think it's important uh, that, uh, first of all, the public know uh, what's the source of the money that is being uh, contributed. So by identifying the related parties, that is, uh, the uh, officers and directors of a corporation, if a corporation <coughs> is uh, making the contribution, that assists with respect to that. As I said, uh, what we're trying to do is to make sure that the controlling person of a corporate entity cannot evade the contribution limits by providing personally the amount up, up to the limit, let's say that's $1,500 or 2000 for the mayor, and then having his corporations that he controls also make contributions that um, w would uh, go beyond uh, the limits. Obviously, if he contributes $500 to a mayoral camp campaign, then the corporations that he controls could contribute $1,500. So the maximum of 2000 is that's the goal that we're trying to accomplish. We are trying to do this in a sensible way, in a way that can be enforced, a way that is not too complicated. Uh, I think the principle is very simple. Uh, I, I recognize that, uh, you know, there are going to be some complexities here. But I think, as you heard from uh, the person who's run campaigns in the past, who testified uh, before, uh, he thinks it's understandable and, can, and is manageable. And I think the OCF could uh, enforce it. And to make it enforceable, we are requiring that uh, if there are corporate contributors, if you're a, co a corporation and you're going to contribute, you have to identify in connection with your contribution on a form. You'd have to do it one time as you, when you uh, make the contribution or as you make it. Who are your related parties and who are your controlling shareholders? So that could be cross-referenced. Um, it could be done electronically, and you can keep track both the campaign could keep track and so could the Office of Campaign Finance of what is the uh, total amount of the contributions that are coming from that source and keeping it within the, uh, the maximum uh, limits. I think this is a more effective way. It deals with the problem and it is not a situation of having, you know, a simplistic uh, ban on all corporations uh, as uh, you heard in the public testimony, you know, there are hardware stores and other kinds of small mom and pop stores that want to contribute, want to have uh, the money come from their corporate contributions. Uh, and uh, there's no reason to not allow that so long as it's not abused and so long as the uh, owner, the person in control of that, doesn't use that as a mechanism to exceed the corporate limits. And I also want to make clear that uh, allowing the corporations to contribute will also allow unions uh, to contribute, and that's another uh, source. So while it's, uh, you know, nice to say it should only be uh, flesh and blood, there are uh, entities uh, that we want to have participate that have First Amendment rights as well uh, to uh, contribute. And so we're trying to allow the, those kind of entities to uh, contribute, but not to allow the form to be used for abuse to evade corporate limits. And that's why we came up with this proposal, which I think is fully workable. I want to um, ask you about the, the definition of control. Uh, and, and the bill defines control as the practical ability to direct a cause to be directed, the financial management policies of an entity, 
A voting interest of 40 percent or more creates a rebuttable presumption of control or of controlling interest. With respect to the officers and directors of a corporation, uh, my question was how do we determine who has the ability to direct financial management, but you said earlier that it would be incumbent upon the corporation to identify who yes. those parties are. Ex exactly. The, the corporation would say who the controlling shareholders are. Now, look, I mean, obviously, if that is abused, if they claim someone who's in control who is not, uh, that could be examined uh, by uh, the law enforcement, by the Office of Campaign Finance, and uh, and by the uh, the prosecutors. So, but obviously, the, a statement that someone is in control when they're not would be a false statement that uh, could be uh, prosecuted. So, we're looking in the first instance for the corporate entity to identify the controlling person. And it's you know it's pretty obvious a person who is uh, directing who's making the contribution there. That basically is the person in control, and the person in control makes a lot of decisions for the entity. Uh, that relate to the financial uh, business of that uh, that entity. If you have a small mom and pop, a sole uh, shareholder, it's pretty obvious who's in control. What we're saying is if you have 40% of the shares, that's a presumption. Now, you could rebut it and say, I've got 40, but this other guy's got 60, and he, can, uh, he controls it. That's fine if that's what the facts are in that situation. But usually when there is uh, diffuse uh, shareholders and one guy's got 40%, He's running the show, and uh, that's the presumption that we have for who's in control of the financial affairs of that entity. Uh, one of the uh, issues that was raised uh, by uh, one of the public witnesses is something that I was thinking about as well is uh, if there's a board of directors, for example, uh, of 10, uh, and each member of the board has a vote, essentially uh, to present uh, uh, control, how would you uh, determine uh, for the purpose of contribution limits and aggregating those uh, who would who would how would that work uh, if you've got a board of directors of 10 and yeah. each person has a vote well b basically uh, it wouldn't be the notion that each director has control because he has one tenth of the uh, of the vote. The question is, who owns the shares of that company? Who's picking those directors? Who is behind this corporation? Who has control of the decision? So, for example, you may have uh, 10 um, uh, members of the board of director, but let's say you have uh, a couple, of, only a couple of shareholders, and one of those shareholders has more than 50% of the vote and picks more than 50% of the directors. That's the person that has control of this entity, not the individual director. So we're not saying that if you're a director on a corporation where you have one-tenth of the vote, that you can't make your own personal contributions. You'd be allowed to make a contribution to the mayor's campaign up to $2,000 or in the chairman up to $1,500. But the shareholder who is in control of that company and in control of those um, directors if he had already contributed uh, $2,000 to a mayor's campaign or 1500 to a chairman's campaign, he couldn't direct those directors to vote a corporate contribution in any, in any amount if he had already exceeded uh, or reached the uh, low limit. You also mentioned earlier, we talked about, uh, you talked about enforcement by OCF. Uh, you think it's something that would be workable. I wanted to ask, uh, how is the uh, Office of Campaign Finance currently able to try contributions coming from corporations that share, share common ownership? Well, uh, we have established a uh, information chair, uh, sharing relationship with the Office of Contracts and Procurement uh, and also the uh, uh, Department of Consumer and Regulatory Affairs, which is a licensing agency. And so we will be uh, using those resources to track uh, um, the uh, ownership of corporations and the uh, control of corporations. However, um, in the, based upon what the Attorney General said, if it starts as an honor system where the um, Office of Contract, uh, the Office of Campaign Finance is required to rely on the information that's provided by the registrant, in this case, the uh, uh, the corporation, there, is, um, there are limited resources for the Office of Campaign Finance to verify that that information is accurate. 
you know, short of an investigation or a complaint, we would have no particular reason to presume that the information is not accurate, and perhaps it is, it is not accurate at the time it's provided. Can I uh, address that? Um, because I, what Mr. Sanford says is uh, absolutely right in terms of uh, current uh, situation. First, uh, we're in favor of giving additional resources to the Office of Campaign Finance, including having investigators. Uh, second, under the current situation, you know, the, the talk you heard about uh, red flags, you know, that, uh, well, you, they could look at it and see that a couple of these limited liability corporations have the same address and so make some assumptions about that. But, you know, there could be totally legitimate and um, completely independent um, entities that are in the same uh, building. And the fact that they have the same address, that really doesn't prove very much at all. And to dry, draw inferences is, is not appropriate. What we're trying to do is to enhance their ability to get to the bottom and be sure that no one is abusing the system. And that, that uh, is done in part, one, by giving additional resources, but second, by putting the onus on the corporate uh, contributor to identify who is the controlling shareholder. And again, I, I don't say that that will inevitably be correct. Uh, they may uh, be misleading. But then, first of all, they can, you could rebut that. You can investigate it, find it's not the case. Then it's sanctionable to have made that false representation. And secondly, uh, to uh, disallow the contributions because they were used to evade the, the corporate limits. So uh, we have to have teeth in the enforcement, but we also have obligations imposed on the contributors to assist the Office of Campaign Finance in getting to the facts. May I just uh, briefly uh, respond to uh, what Mr. Nathan said? Uh, first of all, for the record, I think it's, uh, it's important that I uh, uh, announce here that we do have an investigator on staff as of January 28th. Uh, that was the first hire under our uh, increased resources Good. in the office of the general counsel. So we would hope that uh, our enforcement ability would be increased uh, with that addition to our staff. But uh, secondly, the Office of Campaign Finance does investigate, uh, and the auditors are here, uh, contributions that uh, come from a single, appear to come from a single source. If the address is the same, if the uh, individual signing the check, uh, if the signature looks simi similar, then that would be a red flag. But as Mr. Nathan has indicated, uh, and we have several ongoing investigations, uh, Oftentimes we realize those are separate entities that have a singular financial officer. They might operate out of a, uh, out of a common address, but as the uh, current provisions under the, the uh, DC official code, business code provide, as long as they are in the, uh, as long as they're organized as a separate entity, then that will be, that concludes our investigation because they are not in violation in any existing law. Under the current law, that's correct. Well, well I, I, I agree with that, but, but there was testimony earlier by, by a witness who, who, who seemed to disagree that, that uh, an individual who has multiple LLCs uh, can donate legally through, uh, as an individual, give a maximum contribution, and also give maximum contributions through those multiple uh, limited liability companies. But I, I think it goes a step further, though, because I, I thought there, there, it was stated that there was a position in OCF uh, uh, that this witness had testified to that uh, the Office of Campaign Finance had either provided some sort of opinion or made some uh, testimony <coughs> that there is something uh, prohibitive about that uh, procedure or that uh, practice of individuals donating through multiple LLCs? Well, I, I, I think there was a um, confusion between the discussion on bundling and LLC contributions. That seemed to go back and forth, and I, I was a bit confused so, by so that. So just so the discussion. record is clear, it's perfectly legal under today's laws Under existing law, individual. individuals who control multiple limited liability companies uh, to make contributions through those companies as long as they are organized as independent entities. Can, can you then speak to what the existing law is as it relates to parent companies and subsidiaries? Well, our 
I can, what I, I can address is our approach is based upon a control of 51% or greater. If there is a parent uh, company that has subsidiaries and they, sh they demonstrate that they have 51% or greater control, then that contribution is attributed to the parent company. So they are not permitted to give, to exceed the contribution limit. I just wanted to make sure the record was clear as it relates to that. I want to uh, ask uh, the question next. Uh, the definition of a related party uh, as applied to a corporate donor might <coughs> encompass a lot of people uh, and numerous parent subsidiary corporations, thus making the reporting and data collection requirements complex for donors and the political committees on the receiving end. Uh, again, you stated, Mr. Navin, pretty, pretty clearly that you, you anticipate or it's your expectation that the, the onus would be on the, the corporation uh, to list uh, who has control right. and provide that information. But I guess uh, on the part of OCF, I'd like to ask, do you envision each political committee devising its own data collection mechanism? Do you support this suggestion by the Attorney General that should be information should come from the, uh, the, the donor? Uh, do you anticipate the campaign having a role in making sure it's accurate before they provide it to you once you receive it? Well, we would, um, well, we expect that the information, all the information provided to us is accurate and, you know, that's our expectation and because we would have no reason to doubt it unless um, there's something that suggests that there is some intentional uh, misrepresentation. Um, our concern is our ability to enforce it. It seems to me that uh, it would require much greater resources than perhaps we could ever have to assure that 100% of the contributions can be tracked, verified, and are consistent with existing law, no matter how the law has changed. So we're a bit concerned. And I would also uh, mention that uh, the verification in terms of family members seems to me uh, to be extremely problematic. Uh, I'm not certain that the district government can compel someone who's competing for a contract to reveal who their family members are before they make a contribution to a political campaign. I'm very uh, uh, we haven't seen any legislation in any other jurisdictions that require that, and we haven't looked at all jurisdictions across the country, but that seems that that would be very difficult for the Office of Campaign Finance to verify. And, and that's, a, that's a, uh, obviously a, a very important issue, but it's one that we, we plan to address at a later date. But I do want to uh, circle back to, to the concern you raised about the enforcement uh, uh, of, 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 of this notion that the corporations uh, on an audit system are going to provide the information of who the control, uh, uh, controlling directors are. Uh, hearing that, Mr. Nathan, do, do you, what do you use your response to the OCF's uh, claim that it, would, it would, could potentially create a burden on their office to proactively investigate? Is it your understanding that you don't expect them to proactively investigate all occasions of this sorts of information being provided to the agency and that only when a red flag is raised, there is a law on the books that would, would be able to address it? Well, I, you know, I think what Mr. Sanford said, of course, applies to the current situation as well as to any uh, change in terms of uh, guaranteeing the accuracy of what is presented, even with respect to the, the uh, what we have as the current law. I would assume that uh, the Office of Campaign Finance would uh, accept uh, the filings made by the uh, candidates uh, with the representations made by the uh, corporations, except where there is reason to believe that they are not accurate. And that would come when there are complaints filed by individuals who look at these forms. That's why part of the reason we have uh, as full disclosure as we have. And if people see that there is a problem, that they would raise it with the Office of Campaign Finance, or if on the forms themselves there are red flags, uh, if, uh, you know, if, if they are advised that a corporation is controlled by Mr. X 
and they've already seen on their files that Mr. X has already maxed out in terms of his contributions, and then they see that a corporation that is controlled by him is making contributions to that same candidate in excess of that amount, then they've got reason to investigate. So I wouldn't think that every uh, filing would uh, then be run to ground and uh, have uh, investigations. I would think where there is reason to believe that it is not accurate, either because a complaint's been filed or because in viewing what has come in and uh, cross-checking with uh, through computer programs, they see there's a problem. That's when I would think that uh, the investigators should um, get active and see what's going on here. Okay, and I'm just I'm trying to read through your testimony just to make sure I understand what, what the, the point you're making in terms of disclosure by the donor. Now, when you say disclosure by the donor, you mean disclosure to the actual campaign or disclosure yes. to the Office of Campaign Finance? Well, I assume that uh, the disclosures made to the campaign would be then uh, transferred uh, to the Office of Campaign Finance, and they would see what uh, if, if there's a corporate contribution and the corporation has identified the controlling shareholder, that information would be supplied both to the campaign, which also has a responsibility to ensure that it's not getting uh, contributions in excess of the maximum, and to pass that information along to the Office of Campaign Finance. And so you anticipate there should be some role, obviously, in the campaign in advising its donors of their obligations to... to Absolutely. It's, said it, it's part of the provision and the representation that we're asking a candidate to make that they have explained the rules to the contributors. I think it's a very simple rule to say, look, there's a maximum that you can contribute to my campaign, and you can't evade this um, maximum by using other entities that you control to uh, also contribute to my campaign. So if I'm running for mayor and the notion is uh, you, anybody can give me $2,000 but no more, you make that clear to your uh, donors and uh, any donor that you know has corporations that they control, you make that clear to them and you represent. I made that clear to, the, in, to my uh, contributors and that's a representation that uh, is provided. And you know, it could be put on a card uh, is exact, it's a very simple thing. This is the maximum, and you can't evade the maximum. So perhaps OCF would have some universal form uh, that could be provided uh, in, in, in this case that explains related parties and, and how uh, this information should be provided or captured. We would probably have to develop those forms during the registration. Uh, that could be utilized during the registration process. Um, and, uh, in, and then, of course, uh, donor cards which are used now when they are uh, either functions in which there are multiple donations could probably also capture uh, some of that information as well. And the way it is now, um, if a person, if a campaign is, is, is filing a campaign finance report, uh, it's incumbent upon that campaign to ensure that uh, individuals mm -hmm. or, or corporations have not exceeded the contribution limit. Is it, is it your, uh, uh, through, the, through the mayor's bill, the intention is that uh, a campaign would be responsible for verifying the information provided by a donor on these forms, or would uh, the honor system hold uh, to a campaign? If I'm, if I'm running a campaign, can I rely on uh, 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 disclosure of uh, the, the rule existing and saying that you know, I've, I've let these donors know that this is what the rule is. Now, am I responsible to, to verify this, or, or should I put this on the, this, this responsibility on the Office of Campaign Finance to make sure that what the donor is saying is, is accurate? I think that uh, the uh, it, we can't have the uh, campaign or the candidate to be investigators and go out and check every representation that is made. What I think uh, they have to do is explain what the rules are, make sure that their donors understand the rules, and accept the representations of the donors unless they themselves have reason to believe that there is some evasion uh, going on here. And if they have reason to believe, then they need to check it out and not to be uh, participants in it or even beneficiaries of it. But I think that once they've explained what the rules are, and they have no reason to doubt the bona fides and the representations being made by the donors, then they've got to go on with their campaign and they send this information to the Office of Campaign Finance. And by the way, I think Office of Campaign Finance should generally accept 
these representations again unless the Office of Campaign Finance has some reason based on a complaint or based on the documents themselves or some red flag that emerges to do an investigation. I don't envision in investigating every time there's a representation or a contribution. The reporting requirements imposed by the mayor's uh, proposed legislation include several new provisions that strengthen the oath made at the time a treasurer or a candidate files a report with the Office of Campaign Finance. And uh, I wanted to hear uh, why you thought the, uh, the strengthened oath was necessary. Well, I, I think that in the past, uh, willful blindness has permitted uh, candidates to uh, ignore things. Uh, first of all, put all the responsibility on the campaign treasurer and say, that, look, it's his responsibility. I didn't know what was happening in my own uh, campaign. I don't think that's a very salutary system. I think the candidate himself is responsible or herself is uh, responsible. And what I think they need to represent is they've done their best. Uh, you know, they're not a guarantor. They're not, uh, they can't vouch for everything that is said to the campaign or even by the campaign, but that they have used good faith efforts to lay down the law to their subordinates, that they want full compliance with the law, that they have advised the donors of what the uh, rules are, and that they have no reason to believe that uh, anyone has attempted to evade the law. And if they make that representation, I, I think that they would take some efforts of due diligence, and I think that's all that can be expected, and I think that is more than is expected and is required now. I think you just answered my next question, which has to do with the, the phrase of re reasonable diligence and what you actually expected uh, that to mean and, 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 and what that would constitute, because uh, it, it asks that uh, the campaign filer of the report use re reasonable diligence in preparation of the report and that to the best of his or her uh, knowledge is, is true and complete. Uh, but I yeah. think you've answered that uh, okay. with the statement you just made, though. I want to move uh, on to communications between related parties and drill a little bit deeper into how we aggregate contribu contributions. It could be the case that a corporation has a number of officers and directors. Uh, if one of those controlling officers gives 2000 to a mayoral candidate, that donation would then max out all the other controlling officers and directors. And I know you talked a little bit about this. Uh, as well as the corporation itself and any other parent or subsidiary corporation. So, for example, if I serve as a director of a corporation and I have control of that corporation and my colleague, who is also a controller director, donates to a candidate, I guess the question then becomes, are my personal First Amendment rights abridged uh, by my colleague's donation? And are, are there any constitutional concerns that we need to be mindful of? Well, look, I, I think there are constitutional concerns, and that's why uh, we have um, limited the um, restrictions to those who are actually in control of the corporation. I think it would be pretty rare that uh, there are any more than, uh, let's say, two people who are in control. You, you made before, you talked about a 10-director uh, corporation. Uh, our notion is that if, uh, let's say, the corporation as a result of the um, controlling shareholders, and let's say there are two controlling shareholders, um, they, they've made $2,000. That would preclude each of those two controlling shareholders from contributing any money to that mayoral candidate, but it would not uh, bar any of the remaining directors. If there, let's say there are eight more directors, every one of those directors would be free to contribute up to $2,000 to the mayoral candidate. They're not barred by it their First Amendment rights are uh, not uh, abridged in any way. So um, that's why we've tried to limit who's the controlling shareholder. You can identify who's controlling your corporation. Obviously, uh, if it's not accurate, that can be verified. And if that's not the, the truth, then uh, there could be penalties for that. But you tell us who runs the show, who controls it. If it's a subsidiary, 
if there's a parent running this show and the parent has already contributed uh, the maximum, then the subsidiary shouldn't be able to uh, contribute an a additional amount. That, that's how it would operate. In, in, in drafting legislation, did you, did you take note of any other jurisdictions that uh, take a similar approach with respect to this? Uh, I, I, I'm not confident that we have other jurisdictions that have aggregated in quite uh, this way. But when we looked at what the problems were in the district, uh, this seemed to be focused on a district problem, and uh, we devised this proposal. I think part of this also um, sort of makes an assumption that those uh, directors who have control uh, are regularly communicating about uh, personal donations that they make. And I guess I'm wondering how you envision this playing out uh, uh, logistically within a corporate setting. Uh, how is one director going to know that another director donated in his or her personal ca capacity? Well, as you see, I don't think it's going to become important because uh, it's only the controlling shareholder who has made the contribution who would know that the companies that he controls or she controls are not eligible to make additional contributions to that uh, candidate. But it doesn't have to be communicated to all the other uh, directors because all the other directors are free to make contributions up to the maximum amount of any individual. So th that communication doesn't have to occur. The person who's running the show, who controls the corporation, will obviously know either what he has contributed or what his corporation has contributed. I think that also uh, assumes, though, that there's going to be one person who's running the show. So, uh, well, if it's two, then uh, you know they'll they'll have to know. Uh, there will have to be a communication. But it's the anticipation that it's a very small group, and we're dealing, you know, primarily we're talking about small corporations, close corporations that do not have uh, diffuse uh, owners. Now, I don't think it was the intention uh, of the legislation, but I want to ask it just so that it's clear. Um, uh, how would the aggregation of donations operate with respect to nonprofit corporations, which are, are not permitted to contribute to partisan elections, obviously? Uh, if a controlling director or officer of such a nonprofit corporation donates to a candidate by virtue of qualifying as a related party, that campaign contribution would be imputed uh, to the nonprofit corporation? causing nonprofit to run afoul of laws restricting nonprofit political activity? Is yeah. that Well, we're not, we're not anticipating uh, the nonprofits to uh, contribute uh, here, uh, but um, the same principles uh, would apply. If you control the nonprofit and uh, if you're permitted for the nonprofit to contribute, the same principle would apply. If you're really in control of it uh, and you've already maxed out, uh, you shouldn't be uh, you know, leading or causing your nonprofit corporation to be uh, contributing its funds, uh, assuming they're available for this purpose, um, to the to the candidate. Okay, but but it was clearly not the intention of the legislation to even apply no. in that circumstance. Right. No. You mentioned this, uh, uh, Mr. Nathan, in your testimony, but I want to just make sure we have a full uh, record uh, for the committee to consider. I wanted to ask what your thoughts were on treating limited liabilities companies um, different than other companies. There have been some proposals that come before this committee to ban uh, all donations by LLCs, and there's yeah. some concerns, obviously, about how uh, that might impact other corporations, and, and, uh, and so I want to hear your yeah, thoughts. Yeah, I don't see that uh, th there's a separate rule for LLCs from other corporate entities or other, um, you know, institutions that are not uh, human-run uh, or not human beings. Um, I, I think they should all be treated the same and uh, try to get to the issue here. Certainly, if um, if the controlling shareholders have not otherwise uh, contributed. There's no good reason why an LLC uh, cannot make a contribution like any other uh, corporate entity. I just want to turn to the issue of uh, money orders uh, and campaigns.
You mentioned in your testimony that uh, I believe you did that that uh, money orders should be restricted in the same way that cash contributions yeah. are restricted. The same limits uh, imposed, whatever. But you wouldn't have a problem with the limits being raised, correct? Uh, higher than what they are currently, right? Mr. Mr. Uh, Sanford, can you speak to um, how long? This $25 limit on cash contributions has been in place. I know I don't mean to put you on the spot, but do you have any idea how long that's been? Uh, I think since the uh, beginning of the agency, since the inception of the agency, I'm not certain. Um, I'm going on my 14th year there, and so at least as long as I've been there. And I think we have um, Ms. Coleman was, has been around 20 years, at least as long as she's worked there as well. Obviously, I think you mentioned, uh, Mr. Nathan, I think, Mr. Sobin, you may have mentioned in your testimony, part of the, the issue with money orders is, is the transparency and, and being able to track right. uh, who's, who's uh, given a contribution. Um, but restricting the amount uh, of the money order uh, has also been an, an issue uh, raised by some of my colleagues uh, with respect to uh, a portion of the, the electorate who would like to engage in the political process by donating via money order in the event they don't have a bank account and things like that. Uh, what are your thoughts about uh, how this might impact uh, the ability of some uh, uh, residents and voters uh, to uh, participate in the process? Well, first of all, I, I think that uh, money orders ought to be available to people who want to contribute and uh, participate in the process, and if they don't have bank accounts and can't write checks, that, that it ought to be a vehicle that uh, they would have as well as an alternative uh, to uh, to cash. So we're in favor of allowing uh, money order contributions, but again, you don't want it to be abused. And um, if uh, someone has more than the hundred dollars that they want to contribute, then it seems to me they have to make a record of it in some way that you have exactly um, you know who is making that uh, that contribution. And then there are other alternatives um, in the form of uh, bank checks of some kind uh, that can be um, made. So I think this is a, a right balance. Have it the same amount that uh, cash can be uh, contributed. Um, as I say, the administration is not opposed to raising the cash uh, limit, say, to $100, and that the money order would be the same amount, And uh, but that would be the limit. And if you want to do more than that, you're going to have to make a rec have some uh, hard copy that demonstrates who's making that contribution. And, and, and along those lines, if the issue for money orders is really about disclosure and accountability and transparency, would it make sense to, 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 for OCF, uh, let's say, to uh, develop some sort of form or requirement that would enhance the information uh, that was required uh, to be provided in the event that uh, a campaign donates via money order? Well, in my testimony, uh, as I read it, uh, we indicated that we thought, uh, in view of the fact that all contributions of $50 or greater uh, must be recorded and reported on, on reports of receipts and expenditures, it seems that uh, money orders in at least that amount would be covered and then they would meet the reporting requirement. I'm sorry. I missed the last part of what you just said. Money orders uh, currently all contributions of at least $50 or greater must be reported on the report of receipts and expenditures. And so we indicated that in view of the fact that uh, that's a reporting requirement, money orders in at least that amount uh, might meet that disclosure requirement because it does provide that the recipient identify the donor by name, address, occupation, etc. cetera, uh, if it's a contribution of at least $50 or greater. Should we then allow uh, campaigns to make, uh, accept donations if there is not that actual information that you just uh, talked about? Well, if, um, well, currently, if the information is not provided on the report of receipts and expenditure, uh, despite uh, some earlier testimony, uh, the audit division will issue a request for additional information. And at a minimum, the uh, principal campaign committee is required to 
provide the information or to provide an explanation as to why that information was not provided. And that uh, uh, contribution could be disallowed if, you know, if, the, if the, the explanation is not sufficient. Has the office given any thought to um, not even allowing the ability to file electronically if the information isn't captured at the outset? <coughs> and, and would there be any any concerns uh, to go in that direction? Denying um, would not being able to press send uh, on the electronic filing uh, if all the information that's uh, required isn't entered. We have not uh, actually considered that possibility, but uh, from a practical standpoint. Uh, it could create a, uh, a bottleneck in terms of reports. It would uh, delay that. That's, that's fair. I just want to know if there's something that you ought to give us some thought to. Sure. All right. Yeah, one of the things that, that I want to sort of mention is um, this idea of, of, of uh, uh, the proposals that, that are before the committee. Uh, being able to really enhance our system of, of campaign finance, um, I think the common thread is enforcement. And I think a couple of things that we mentioned and we discussed today uh, relating to the Office of Campaign Finance's ability to actually enforce these laws is going to be something that we need to think about. Um, uh, as it relates to aggregation of contributions, as it relates to money orders, uh, I think it's important for the committee to, to point out that it's not going to create a situation where, uh, I don't know that we could create a situation where the Office of Campaign Finance has enough resources that they're proactively looking for violations of these types of laws. Obviously, there's an audit function that you all already have that if there are some red flags, uh, you're going to pursue it. But I want to sort of temper any expectation of folks in the public to think that uh, because these laws, uh, if passed, are, are going to be in place, that you all would have the the the, the resources of the manpower to actually uh, find every single violation of this sort. Uh, if, if you're asking corporations to identify uh, who are the controlling uh, uh, directors and we're relying essentially on an honor system, um, uh, it's going to be difficult for you all to then uh, turn around and, and, and sort of proactively find all these sorts of violations. And I don't think that we, you know, members of the public, I know some of my colleagues and, and others, uh, think that uh, this is going to be a panacea for the violations and, and, and the issues that we've confronted in elections over the last few years. And I just wanted to sort of put that on the record so to the people aware that I don't know if you have any response. Yeah, to we that. appreciate that because uh, part of the criticism the office has received over the years, and I think we heard uh, something that someone alluded to that, uh, uh, today is that uh, the Office of uh, Campaign Finance relies on uh, public complaints uh, in, um, you know, our reports or news, uh, reports of the news media to uh, take position and to uh, initiate investigations or reviews. Uh, that is not accurate. Uh, however, we have not had the resources to be every place at the same time and to uncover every possible uh, in, uh, impropriety regarding campaign finance. And that will never exist. And so we appreciate your, uh, you know, your position. Uh, however, uh, and it's been an ongoing process, we do conduct uh, uh, periodic, periodic audits. Uh, we uh, pro, uh, conduct full field audits based upon our ability uh, the abilities of our staff to do so. Uh, prior to our uh, recent good fortune in which we uh, were granted uh, the ability to increase our staff, we were functioning with a staff of 16. Uh, at the same time, we were being compared to uh, much larger agencies and being criticized for not being able to do the work that those agencies did. Um, even. Uh, with the projection of perhaps 10 additional staff members, we will still not be in the position to, uh, to cover every base at, or ev at every single uh, turn uh, through the campaign finance process. 
but we, we are committed to uh, using our resources to enforce the uh, Campaign Finance Act to the extent that we can. Mr. Duffy, can I comment on your uh, statement as well? Um, Look, I think what you say is 100% uh, accurate. Uh, there's no panacea. There's no uh, guarantees that uh, every possible violation uh, will be found. But I think it's incumbent on the council to demonstrate that it really cons is concerned about the issues of campaign uh, finance and not to allow the status quo to continue. It's important to send a message both to uh, campaigns and to the public and to the Office of Campaign Finance that you really want these laws to be enforced and that you give them the resources to do it and give them the tools in the statute to uh, take care of the problems that have been uh, seen. When you know we pass laws dealing with the Internal Revenue Service, it's not anticipated that every violation of the uh, tax laws will be uh, prosecuted and found. But we give uh, the tools there, both by legislation and by resources, to say we want these things enforced and we're serious about it. And the same thing when you have traffic uh, uh, speed limits. We can't get everybody who speeds, uh, but that's not a reason not to impose the speed limits and to have uh, the enforcement mechanisms we have for those who are found to have uh, been speeding and we, and we prosecute those cases. So I think it's important that uh, the council stand up and say, look, these have been problems. We need to try to correct the problems. We're making good faith efforts. And to send a message to both the public, to the candidates, and to the Office of Campaign Finance that we really want these laws enforced. And we want you to do your best to do it, recognizing there's no panacea. Every violation is not going to be found. Every violation is not going to have the same uh, consequence. But it's serious to us, and we want to improve our system, and we're not just going to kick the can down the road and uh, not enact any effective uh, legislation. So that's why the mayor has made this a high priority, has given legislation that has the tools in it, that proposes to give additional resources to the Office of Campaign Finance, and says that we're serious about this matter. Uh, well, well uh, I agree with your statement, but I, but I have to say, uh, Mr. Nathan, that part of your statement implies that this council has not stood up and demonstrated that it takes this issue seriously. I would disagree with uh, any uh, uh, implication that that's the case. I think uh, this council has uh, passed a comprehensive campaign finance reform. Obviously, there's still some work yet to be done, uh, but there has been some work done. And I think the Office of Campaign Finance would agree that there's been some resources uh, directed uh, in, in, in their uh, direction as well to beef up the auditing staff. And I think we've seen a difference uh, as a result of those increased resources. And I know the mayor supports that, uh, but I definitely don't want to have uh, uh, the people watching this hearing uh, walk away with the impression that this council does not take this issue seriously. Obviously, I'm one of the newer members of the council, uh, but I, in defense of my colleagues who are here uh, in a, prior to me, I think that they take this seriously. I think that they've demonstrated that through the bills that they've introduced. I think they've demonstrated that through the laws that have been enacted. And I think they would agree that there's still some work left ahead. And, and as a chair of this committee, uh, I'll let you know that we take this uh, very seriously. This is a high priority. Uh, we definitely want to make sure that we enact something uh, that's serious, that has some teeth. Uh, but we don't want to move so quickly uh, that, that uh, what we do isn't workable, uh, that it's inviable that it creates more of a problem for implementation through the Office of Campaign Finance uh, than it actually does to, to address the issue that I think we all can agree exists as it relates to campaign finance. So uh, I appreciate your statement, but I definitely want uh, everybody to, to know that uh, you know, this body, this council takes this issue very seriously, and we're going to work uh, to make sure that we, uh, we have some uh, uh, really uh, strong laws that have some teeth, uh, but, but obviously uh, work to affect some of the issues that we've identified in the process over the years. I just like to say the uh, Office of uh, Campaign Finance is very grateful for the increased resources that we have received because for the first time uh, since I've been on staff there, uh, we have the capacity to divide the reports, analysis, and audit division into an analysis division and an audit division, to uh, divide the general counsel's division into a hearings division and an investigative division. And uh, we also have the capacity to develop uh, research and records division. 
as well. And so without those increased resources, we would not be in a position uh, to, you know, to pursue those interests which are critical to our mission. Well, I appreciate uh, each of you coming down to testify today. I did want to ask Mr. Sobin, I know you mentioned in, your, in the answer to your testimony that, that, that obviously the, the uh, Vega Board cares about these issues, but that enforcement will not rest with the agency. But if there's anything else you want to add for the record, yeah, feel free to do so. No, I, I defer to my well-informed colleagues here. Uh, I'm sure that uh, they can uh, recite uh, campaign finance reform in their sleep at this point, and Vega is relatively new to the uh, to the game, so I defer to my colleagues. Thank well, I you. I appreciate the testimony of each of you uh, uh, gentlemen here today, and uh, I appreciate the work that you've uh, contributed thus far. I look forward to working with the H. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you Council Member. And we've been joined by Thank one you. last public witness uh, who would like to Thanks. provide some testimony. Appreciate so I want to give Mr. Michael Syndrome the opportunity to come forward uh, and make a statement. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Michael Syndrome, disabled veteran, served our country more than most. In the words of Council Chair Philip Heath Mendelson, the integrity of the Council is tarnished. Truth be told, it's obliterated. You've got five bills on tap, and I took the liberty of pulling each and every one. The bottom line and the mantra ought to be any and everything that is contributed, donated, what have you, is to be reported. Repeat, any and everything that is donated, contributed, what have you, is to be reported. Then we don't split hairs, we don't have questions, we don't have exemptions, we know exactly what is to be done, how it's to be done, and the consequences there too. Let's turn to the uh, Bill 20 uh, 0003, the Comprehensive Campaign Finance Reform Amendment Act of 2013. I direct your, the committee's attention to page four. You've got the figure, expenses do not exceed 500. In other words, for reporting, talks about realty. Line 11 again, exceed 500. Bottom line should be zero. Anything and everything that is contributed is reported, plain and simple. And it's to be made accessible online and hard copy. Just like I walk in your office or any of the council folks' office for a, a witness list or a calendar of hearings, this ought to be public information. If you truly, if the council truly, you know, wants to make this right, because right now it is not. It's far afield. The art of good governance, accountability, rule of law and transparency is not and hasn't happened. We just had about uh, horse sailing. I mean, you know, that kind of mentality. Business as usual. This is not good. And it continues as we speak with impunity. With the same bill that I referred to, on page uh, 6, you got the figure exceed 500. All these figures need to be zeroed out. This bill is replete with numbers. On page 10, oh, it's got here, and I quote, um, the report shall describe the receipts and expenditures of candidates for mayor, attorney general, chairman and members of the council, and president, members of the state board of education, shadow senator, and shadow representative, but shall exclude candidates for advisory neighborhood commissioner. Why should it exclude? It should include. ANC is to bring government closer to the people and people closer to the government. That's grassroots. So if graft and corruption and payola is happening there, why are they excluded? Okay? So that should be included all across the board. ANC's elected official. And I'm thinking about an instance where a chair of an ANC uh, sat on nonprofit boards and then he is awarding grants to those same nonprofits. So if you're excluding you know, that kind of conduct, you're just rubber stamping the culture of corruption. Moving along in the same bill, page 12. Any contribution greater than 200 received? Zero. Any and everything received is reported. Then there's no question. None. We don't have to split hairs. We got a, in this uh, same bill, on page 15, makes one or more, one or more expenditures totaling more than 1,000. Zero it out. On page 16, um, contractors. Well, the money orders we referred to, $25. 
Because something has been on the books, as was reported here, 20 years in conning with the employee, government employee, that should tell you something hasn't worked for as long as it's been on the books. That money order and cash contribution ought to be reported, whether it's $25, $0.25, whatever the case may be. Same cash and kind checks, everything's reported. And then on page 16 again, covered contractor seeks or holds contractors contracts or grants with a district with a cumulative value of 250000 or more. Zero it out. Any contract whatsoever, any, even subcontractors that are doing business with the district have to disclose who they're contributing to, the amounts, et cetera. Then there's no question. Page 18, again, the, the 250000 well, backing up a moment. Uh, contribution expenditures shall not exceed the aggregate of 300 per person per election. Zero it out. Then you've got the 250000 again, referring to c contractors. Zero it out. And then ultimately the same bill, page 21. Um, there is a proviso here, the last line. Must be initiated, well, we, subsection C. All actions of the Elections Board, the United States Attorney for District of Columbia, or the Attorney General for District of Columbia, to enforce the provisions of subtitles A, B, D, and E of this title must be initiated within six years, actual occurrence. I would change that to seven. I would make it seven. I think it's more appropriate. The, uh, the next bill, and I'll be very brief, uh, B2025. Uh, this deals with the uh, money orders. Well, it's got here, in no case shall a person receive or make a contribution legal tender or by money order in the amount of 25 or more. Zero it out. Then there's no question. The next bill, uh, 2028, on page one, again, any amount exceeding $25 uh, for candidate, for State Board of Education, so on, or for member ANC, so on? No. Zero it out. There's no question. The bill uh, B2037, the contractors, $250,000, zero it out. Any contractors doing business with the district, any contributions made. So there's no question. There's no question. Well, we assume this is... No question. You know exactly where the council stands, what needs to be done, how it's to be done, plain and simple. Last bill is, uh, and thank you for your indulgence, uh, B2043. This deals with the uh, co contribution limit, the um, money order. Well, cash, in excess of 2500 No. Zero it out. Money order, in excess of $100. Zero it out. No, then we know clearly, you know, where we stand. I want to conclude, Mr. Chair. There was a, there is, uh, there appears in the uh, February 22nd press, crime and maybe punishment in D.C. It states in our quote, Tommy Wells had requested creation of an ad hoc committee, which according to council rules would have led to another investigation before imposition of any stronger sanction. This refers to um, your colleague, Mr. Graham. And I might add, when the council chair, Philip Heath Mendelson, was confronted with this issue, he bamboozled, he obfuscated, frustrated and obstructed, and until his feet was put to the player, then he ultimately took some kind of action. But reading on further, which according to council rules would have led to another investigation before imposition of any stronger sanction. I did what I thought was right for the council, Wells told me, adding the council must take action to remove the continuing ethical cloud over it. He disagreed, however, that Graham's actions merited censure. He drew a distinction between the Ward 1 legislator and Marion Barry, who was censured in 2010. Marion gave a contract to a girlfriend, drove her to the bank to cash the check, and when she got back in the car, she handed him cash from that check, explained Wells. Jim may have intervened on behalf of a campaign donor, but that donor did not give him any cash. That's dangerous partitioning. Repeat, that's dangerous partitioning. Former Atlantic Council um, and William Lightfoot asserted Graham's offenses equally to Marion Barry Barry's. Graham should be punished equally. Let's all say amen. And is not one of the better, if not the best, definitions of justice to treat equals equally and unequals unequally? Eh? When you do that, dangerous partitioning, not good. A any questions? I'd be delighted to field them at this time. Again, thank you for the indulgence um, of this committee. I did want to bring one other matter to this uh, committee's attention, and that is this, talking about ANC and council and so on. I happen to hail from Ward 4, ANC 4B, and in the period of 2006, 2005, 2006, 
I, I am. Yeah, I appreciate you testifying, and, and obviously I wanted to, to indulge you because uh, I wanted to hear what you had to say, and the committee is going to take your testimony under advisement, particularly as it relates to the uh, the bills that are issued here today. But I would ask you if you could be mindful of the clock, if you, if you could wrap up. In conclusion, uh, Mr. Chair, in the 05-06 uh, time frame, ANC-4B, uh, Muriel Bowser was the treasurer. And I made a FOIA request for the checks. Guess what? No checks exist. I then followed up and said, well, if that's the case, I'd like to have the financial court reports. They kept stonewalling me. The city auditor says, well, you've got to pay hundreds of dollars to get what I am rightfully entitled to receive. There was one check in particular that vexed my spirit. It was written to Peaceaholics. And initially, I'll wrap up, Mr. Chair. Initially, it was said, don't know anything about it. Then fessed up and says, oh, yeah, we wrote a $1,000 check to Peaceaholics, not even in our, in our ANC. And then last but not least, there's an Office of Campaign Finance docket number, 03F27. I'm going to pass up a copy of it. It involves Joy Holland, who's Muriel Bowser's chief okay. of stuff. Okay, Mr. Senator. And you can, you can you. peruse it at your convenience. Thank you. I don't have any questions. I do want to say uh, that on March 7th, the committee will hold a hearing on two bills, Bill 20-42, the Constituent Service Program Amendments Act of 2013 and the Campaign Finance Training Amendment Act of 2013. The time is now 2.19 p.m. and this hearing stands adjourned.